we don't want to increase the, um, uh, the, the temperature around these things. Because, you know, if it, if, it, if it blows up, I'd rather it was just, you know, we carry our dead out at night. Uh, we don't really, really want to tell the world about it. Um, yeah, because it's, it's in no one's interest, right? Uh, because, again, there's, there's still an academic uh, uh, position on these things. So we're, we're sensitive to that. Um, so the, the way that this is, this is done is, is we'll invest money. And that, so this is the reason I, I, did the, uh, I did a slide presentation, is actually this is our active seed portfolio. See, these are the ones that are still alive. And one of the things that, 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 that I wanted to show is that actually these are quite chunky monkey for an early seed experiment. So, you know, we're, we're into the um, uh, a couple of million pounds, which we're prepared to write off if it doesn't work for a, for a, given, a given project. So, you know, we're happy to be able to, to, to write these sorts of um, amounts off. But we don't have to write all of it off, of course, because some of these things are, are, have already graduated or are graduating into a full-blown Series A. But by the time we get to that point, we already have a good idea of what we've got in our hand. And that's the reason we're doing it. So um, we also announced yesterday, apart from the creation of the new firm, um, that we'd, that we'd uh, raised another, another fund. Um, so, but again, it's, it's, it's along the same lines as the existing fund. Half of it is GSK and j, &J. The other half is institutional funds like pension funds, insurance companies, that sort of, that sort of thing. Um, the difference this time, though, is that it, it took a while for us to get people confident with the experiment that was our, our existing fund. The, this, this current fund is no longer an experiment. People can see the track record, can see that it actually does deliver a return. And, in fact, we were massively oversubscribed for this, for this, uh, this new fund. So if you're looking for... Um, how much investor appetite there is for, for doing this sort of stuff, uh, it's pretty large. Um, so I'm just going to uh, uh, finish on this one. Um, the consequence of this is that we've got a lot of first in class, so unprecedented stuff in, in this portfolio. That's what happens if you run the seed experiment. It is almost like running a program. You are going to end up with, thing, with a portfolio that looks like this. There's still a lot of risk in it, but, you know, hopefully a few of those will come through. And we don't need many of them to come through, maybe two or three, to make the fund work. That's me done. Thank you. Uh, the, next, uh, the next speaker, that's obviously uh, what we're looking for here, is to see, you know, how we can promote, you know, these early stage investments. I think that Kevin and his uh, partners are leaders in this particular field. Uh, and, uh, and, and that'll be interesting in the discussion. Uh, Antoine. Managing partner of, uh, of Sophie Nova, and uh, in all presentations that I've seen over the past five years, Sophie Nova always makes a point of saying that early stage investment is part of their DNA and part of what they do. So uh, perhaps, Antoine, you can tell us a little bit more uh, about that. So thank you for inviting a, a non Brit on this. On this <laughs> I thought, uh, you know. Uh, I didn't know what was going to happen here, if there was going to be some fire or whatever. So I'm really happy that I've, I've survived so far. So um, Sophie Nova is a, is a um, venture capital firm focused on life science investments. And, and it's a firm that's been going on for a long time. Uh, it was set up in the 70s, 1972. Uh, I wasn't there uh, at the time, as you can hopefully imagine. But, um, uh, but the firm then went to the US in 1976. Um, was a founding investor of Genentech, of Biogen, of uh, uh, you know, Millennium, a number of companies that, uh, that did uh, incredibly well o over time. It was a, a man called Jean Deliage who had a, a, an amazing career that, that was the founder uh, uh, in the US of, of, of Sophie Nova and uh, helped us basically uh, bring this, this competence back. So from Paris, which is where we are, we only have one office, we invest uh, throughout Europe including the UK and, uh, and the US, about two-thirds Europe, one-third the US. And uh, we have one and a half billion euros under management. Uh, we just raised a new fund. It was announced in December, 300 million euro, which is purely uh, an early stage firm. So we have some differences of, I mean, you will see every fund has a, has a, um, a profile. And, um, uh, and, you know, we are, I think all of us are, are, are quite, uh, quite different. There are things that are very similar. Um, like index, we, we do seed investments 
Uh, in fact, it's really part of our practice. And like index, we sorry, Medici. Medici, yeah, yeah I know. Sorry, yeah, I, yeah. I, I like the first one. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, we um, we will uh, we will do uh, investments without telling the world about it. In fact, we will just number them. See number one, two, three. Uh, and the reason is indeed because you know the, it, we, we live in a world where the statistics is, is awful. I mean, there's you know. 6.3% chance of, of getting a product, uh, you know, which is preclinical to, to market. I mean, who wants to play that, that statistics? You just cannot do it. You know, might as well go to the casino and you know, play on the red. That's, that's a lot better. So we, we don't do that. But science is, of course, at the origin. You need to be able to do the killing experiments. I mean, that's the way we, we, we talk about it. And we, we don't want to create expectations. And it's not just with our investors who, of, of course, you know, if you tell them this is going to be revolutionizing medicine, and then you don't, you know, they think, he told me he was going to revolutionize, you know, this or that. Uh, that's one thing. You don't want to create expectations with, with the entrepreneur because you, you have to t tell him or her, you know, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, there's likelihood that this is not going to work, but at least we're going to go through that. And that could be a, could be a purely uh, scientific experiment, uh, but it could also be, um, uh, for instance, you may have to license some patents or license a, a drug from a pharma company or from an, another uh, group uh, as a condition because, you know, RIP diligence suggests that. And it's also creating expectations, uh, low expectations with the team uh, because we're in a business where, uh, you know, you put your finger into the cogs and sort of the old arm goes in before you realize, blimey, I, you know, I wasted 20 million. Why didn't I stop before? So stopping before it's too late. It's a huge element. It's not about making the right decision, investment decision. It's, it's being able to stop when it's too late. So the seed investment for us really is a way to do that. And we, uh, I mean, I can give you a pretty um, uh, recent example. Not recent, but an example of a company that we seeded where today, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, it just announced yesterday raising 60 million pounds. It's not an Oxford spin-out. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a university that starts with a C. Can I mention that? Is that okay here? The other place. All right. It's the other place. Uh, but, you know, so, you know, of course, Woodford uh, has, you know, very, uh, you know, has committed money and Imperial Innovation has, has committed a lot of money to this, uh, to this company. So major U UK investors, but who seeded this company? It's us. You know, who put the first money? Nobody need, needed to know about it because we thought this might fail. And it was around Steve Jackson and his uh, knowledge of, of Derb enzymes, et cetera. So we took the early risk, but not telling anyone. So putting a tiny bit of money, making sure that this company could at least progress in a field where people say, well, it's not going to work. Or it's too complicated. Or, you know, the chemistry is awful. But no, OK, so you do the work. And then when you're ready, you can go to the next stage, still do a Series A, which we led. But so that's, that's how, how you do this. So that's really the focus, um, the, the, the focus of, of Solofinova, you know, building companies. And I, I'll, I'll talk about that because that's, a, I think, uh, an existential difference between Medici and Thank ourselves, uh, is that we, you know, this asset-centric where the company building, you know, uh, it has been a debate, which maybe I've escaped most of you, but uh, maybe 10 years back, I would say people, you know, some people have said the old model is, is gone. You know, building companies and spending 100 million is too capital intensive, and then, you know, you hit the wall and everything falls down, and you've got this brick and mortar, 100, 100 employees into chemists under under this uh, these hoods, and and nothing comes out of that. So, you know, some people have, have gone, you know, the asset centric way, say, okay, let's let's take that risk of, of uh, you know, funding below radar that 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 risk and flipping that that coin and see whether it works, and nobody's going to know if it doesn't work. Uh, we have taken a different route, or we've said, no, we think the model is not broken, it's just, it just been basically gone the wrong way, and people have lost track of, of you know, what, what it means to actually build a company, and you have to think about, you know, which is some, somewhat different from science, but cost of capital. You know, we, it's not our money. It's money that we get from LPs who want to return. So how do we, within not 20 years, not even 15 or 10, but more like five years, get to a result that people you know, can count in, in money terms? Uh, yeah, because if you don't do that, then they don't, don't give you money back. Uh, that's, and so our way is building companies. And the science is important. You need to kill it if it doesn't work. But the best science will not give you, you know, 
a, a great company, a, a Genentech or Nangen or, or, or uh, you know, an Actelian, and we were involved uh, with two out of these three. Apparently, we said no twice to Amgen, by the way, so that's the, the company culture. I think you, you were in Amgen. We were in yeah. yeah, so we did Genentech, they did Amgen. Right? <laughs> but, um, but uh, yeah, for us, what we are looking for is, of course, exceptional science, but that, unfortunately, for us, is not the way we, we look at this. We want this plus management. Sometimes management is not there. As you said, scientists often just do not want to be, and they are right, by the way, not to be involved with the companies, or at least in a way that is not necessarily, they may not be the, the managers. But that's what we're looking for. That's why we do very few investments. We do a lot of seeds. We kill them if it doesn't work. But part of our seeds is also, can we bring the people? Can we bring, you know, on the board, can we bring, uh, you know, the, the management team that will make this a success? And that's what we're looking for. And if you go to our offices, and you're all invited, not at the same time, but, uh, <laughs> um, then uh, you will see that we have the portraits of our, of our entrepreneurs on the wall. We don't have the, you know, the red herring of, you know, we raised 100 million with this or that company. We have actually the faces of these people because, you know, this is what we, this is what we sell. Um, you know, and, and their success basically, ultimately, is our success. So I'll, I'll stop here. Okay. Thank you, Antoine. Um, Genghis. Um, so obviously, uh, Abingworth is a UK-based uh, fund and, uh, and com investment company, actually, quoted company. And uh, you have been involved in a lot of uh, the early stages of uh, biotechnology over the years. Uh, my friend David Leathers, way back when. Uh, now, would like to sort of get a, a view of, you know, where are you in terms of the investment cycle, in terms of what, uh, you know, what early stage versus late stage companies uh, you might look at now. And also, your perspective as uh, a very heavy investor in the U.S. Uh, of the U.K. versus, you know, versus the U.S. And we'll go back to that with uh, both Kevin and Antoine afterwards. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Can you hear me? Because there's, no, uh, there's a shortage of panel mics, apparently. <laughs> um, so, yes, uh, Abingworth was set up um, in the early 70s, about the same time as Sofinova. Slightly later. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what one year? <laughs> uh, we, um, for the last 30 years, we've been a pure life sciences uh, venture capital firm um, and really made our name doing early stage investing, um, particularly in the UK and in the US. Um, more recently, we've become rather more diversified. We've done quite a lot of late-stage investing, um, and we were investing, doing venture deals that um, happened to be public companies. So we, we invented the term VIPE, a venture investment in public equity, whereby we take a stake in a listed company that hardly trades and take a board seat and treat it as if it was a venture investment. Um, and so, um, uh, I see Roger Harrison's in the uh, audience here, so Algata was one of those, um, which subsequently got um, acquired by Bayer. Um, I think uh, partly because of this, people have come to view us as late stage. We've never actually exited early stage, it's just that it had slowed down to a trickle. But for example, um, with uh, Index, now Medici, we did um, Gensite, which was uh, really a very early stage. In Paris. In Paris, of course. <laughs> <laughs> very early stage gene therapy company, although it's now in a clinic. Um, and I think that we are also, you, you may have seen a week ago, we announced that we'd raised a co-development fund, a clinical co-development fund. That's a specialized um, phase three um, uh, financing approach we have where we, co -fund, we finance and co-develop phase three assets. Um, and that's in a separate bucket. Uh, and we have two platform companies that do that, Avilion and, and SFJ. Um, but uh, w uh, if we go back uh, historically, we've been involved in many of the early stage UK companies. So Lexa is one example which came out of Cambridge University and the work of um, Shankar um, Balasubramanian, who's now a fellow of the Royal Society. Um, and that was a company which had outstanding chemistry that could help in doing um, super fast, uh, ultra high throughput DNA sequencing. But they didn't know how to make machines. Um, and so we merged them with a US company called Lynx that had machines but no chemistry. Um, and then we needed to get a, 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 somebody to manage this company. And for a company like that, an ultra-fast, ultra-low-cost DNA sequencing, there was really nobody on this side of the Atlantic. And we can come back to that in, in, in a minute. So we actually hired John West out of Applied Bio. Um, and we couldn't raise the financing unless he signed a CEO, and he wasn't going to sign a CEO unless we did the financing, so back to back, uh, we did both of those. Um, and that company uh, got acquired by Illumina. Um, uh, we did um, Aztecs, which was based on the work of um, Tom Blundell and Chris Abel um, at Cambridge. 
and um, that uh, went on to get acquired by Otsuka more recently. Um, and our three most recent investments have all been preclinical. So we are back to doing early stage in a big way. And the most recent of those was Kisios, a company here in the UK, in London. Um, it's a spin-out from Imperial College, uh, based on the work of Professor Guido Franzono. Um, so I think you know, we're, we're back to doing uh, these early stage deals. And we are right now trying to do a true gleam in a professor's eye company that will require a C financing of perhaps two or three hundred thousand pounds. But um, we're having, there's three different institutions involved and trying to get the technology out is not easy. And I know Stephen, you specially asked that I, I could ad address this. Um, so uh, I know generalizations are dangerous because they encourage stereotyping and there's always exceptions to the rule. But I'm going to make two broad generalizations here that I think are very important to how we try and get technologies out of uh, the universities in the UK and into early stage companies. And the first I would say is that in general, um, the US technology transfer offices are much more interested in getting the technology out there um, in the fastest way possible. And they really um, are more important to make sure that it happens and that it gets used and that it gets works than to maximize a return. And in general, here in the UK, people are, the TTOs are more interested in trying to maximize a return. Um, so the, the negotiations tend to take longer. They tend to be more demanding. Um, and with a few exceptions, most of the TTOs don't have organizations behind them that continue to co-fund these companies as they need um, more money. Um, so in some ways, it's, it's slightly obstructive. Now, I I'm not trying to offend anybody here. This is a generalization, and, the, and there are exceptions. But th that, that would be my first broad generalization. Um, and the second is that in the US, um, I would say they generally give the inventor a much bigger piece of the pie. And I think that the TTOs in the uh, UK, on average, are a bit miserly. So any of you who have gleams in your eye about uh, setting up companies, you should negotiate harder to get a bigger piece and try and get some comparable data from the US. Yeah. Um, and I think both of those um, are, are relevant to the speed of formation of new companies and how easy it is to get um, uh, new companies. In fact, there are examples um, of uh, US uh, universities putting IP more or less in the public domain and taking either nothing or a very token royalty on it in order to get it commercialized quickly um, and to, see, to try and make the world a better place by getting it out quickly. It's not just about profits. Um, you know, you know, universities um, are mostly privately, uh, publicly financed and there is an element, there's a strong element of altruism here. And we all like to think of ourselves as altruistic capitalists, uh, and we are, because we're trying to get the drugs to the market as well as get a return for our LPs. But these are some of the challenges, um, and, and I do put it to you that they are different on the uh, two sides of the Atlantic. Genghis, thank you very much. That's actually an excellent segue. We're finally getting somewhere here. Um, there's an excellent segue to the discussion that I think we really need to have, which is, you know, wh where are the bottlenecks, uh, Antoine, Kevin, uh, where are the bottlenecks to, to actually, we've heard data that, uh, that suggests that the UK is doing relatively less better than, uh, than the US. And despite the numbers that were, the statistics that were given this morning, if you actually dig into those statistics, it's not, it's not as good as people think it is. <clears throat> uh, and to some extent, one of the questioners actually uh, mentioned that early this morning. <clears throat> but if you take, for example, the total number of public biotech companies in this country, and you take out, you, you take out let's say, Shire and BTG, which are sort of more licensing operations, although BTG does do some stuff in, in NAS. If you take those out, the total cap market capitalization is somewhere around $6 billion, um, you know, which if you compare that to the United States, there are at least 10 companies uh, in the U.S. that have $6 billion valuations. Um, you know, so it's, yeah, well, Antoine. You know, I come from France, you know, and we invest throughout Europe. We invest in the U.K., we invest in Italy, we invest in Austria, in, in Germany, and everywhere. And, you know, everyone is sort of whipping themselves, you know, sort of thinking, oh, it's so bad here and so good mm -hmm. in the U.S. And, you know, it's... It's sort of a, it ne never stops. I mean, look at, the, on, on the statistic you just gave, in, you know, the total market cap of the companies uh, listed on the, on the Paris Euronext, okay, which is, you know, a, a premier uh, um, market in, in, in Europe by, by many standards. Uh, we're talking about maybe 80 companies and the total market cap is 11 billion, which, which Same problem. No, but, you know, <laughs> no, man, hold on. You know, from where we're coming from, it's, Wonderful. You know, yeah. we had our first IPO of, I think it was Genset in 97 or something, 98, and 
you know, uh, so from one company we now have 90 and, and it's 11 billion market. Fantastic. You should, we should all rejoice about this. Of course, when you look back, because there is, I think 150 companies that are above 5 billion of market cap in the US, which certainly were until the summer. So I don't know what the statistic is today. But, uh, and there are, you know, dozens that are above 50 or 40, and there are a number that are above 100 billion. So, yes, indeed, it's, it, looks, it looks so bad. But, you know, the question is, you know, how bad are we compared to the US? It just, it just needs to stop. Because, well, now, let me just tell you why, yeah. because we, you know, we started 20 years later and you could, you could do whatever you want. You know, you, we will always be 20 years younger than, mm -hmm. than the US and when they were nice and healthy and 20, we were toddlers on our fours and, you know, when they were already 30 mature and we were sort of a sporty adolescents. So that's, you know, that's, that's gone. We, we now are, you know, so, but we have a lot, a lot of way to go. There are many issues with Europe, and it's not just the UK. And I would say, you know, I'm, I'm telling you from you know, the Paris perspective and the French perspective, the, 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 the UK, not talking about Austria or Italy, you know, we, we are actually, I mean, the UK is actually doing pretty well, from my perspective. Yeah. It's doing very, very well. We, we have some hang-ups, you know, and the UK have its own history from, from where we sit, you know, for instance, you know, Marie Mastat, remember? British biotech, yes. Yeah, but I mean, it needs to be said because this is just so much in, in the British people's mind still. To this day, well, it's, it's awful. Well, this is this is a big problem so, because I mean the whole institutional. You know, lie down on the couch for for a few <laughs> sessions and get. <laughs> you know, I said it just to, to be able to just get it out of, of you guys. You know, it's it's gone, and yeah. and it, this is not about Marie Mastat anymore. You know, it's it's about yeah. you know, and it's not just because you know Woodford is put you know piling money. It's fantastic. You know, yes, of course. What if you remove Woodford? What, what do you care? It's money, and it's in your system, yeah. and you should be happy and grab it, and yeah. and, and it just yeah. look at the. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, it's not just about the Brits. The French. I remember a minister, French minister at a conference, biotech conference, probably 15 years ago, saying, you know, there's two things that the French hate: failure and success. <laughs> <laughs> And, but you know, you guys, I'm sorry, okay, you're not that different, and and and, and that's that's a problem. And, and you need, so once you think, okay, you know, what do we do, and how do we, and you, you know, we we funded Actelion from the from the get go. This was four people in a corner office, and okay, they are 15 billion market cap company. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen every day, but you know, it's possible. In Switzerland, there was nothing outside of Novartis and Roche. There was nothing, no startup at the time. People said, well, no Switzerland. No startup, you know, it's not in the mentality. People don't do that. And look at how what's, what's happened. So I think, you know, just get out, get rid of your yeah. hang-ups, and just don't compare yeah, to the U.S. Look at what it's so much better today than it was 15 years ago. Yeah, I'd like to change tack uh, ever so briefly. That thank you very much for for that, uh, Kevin. Perhaps we can address the whole issue of you know wh wh what do venture capitalists look at in terms of the level of translation uh, at at which something becomes interesting and becomes something that you want to invest in. So at what, at what point, you know, in the cycle, in the scientific cycle, does something become interesting? And in the UK, is there enough of that versus elsewhere? Uh, you know, is there enough funding that is going into getting translation to the point where it needs to be so that you as investors can say, okay, that's far enough, that's something that I'm, I'm interested in doing, apart from it being first in class or any of those issues. You know, so perhaps okay. you can so, address so, that. So we don't care where it comes from. Yeah. I mean, that's the first thing. So we're, we're, we, look all, we look everywhere. Yeah. So uh, whether, it's, whether it's from the UK, a lot of the stuff we do ends up in the UK, but it originated somewhere else. So we'll, we'll do UK companies with technology or products that come from elsewhere. Right. So we, we, and there are very good reasons why you want to do that, as opposed to put it somewhere else. So, I mean, we're net importers. Um, the, uh, the second thing is that all we do, and I think every venture firm is the same, all we do is reflect the market. We're just basically part of the food chain. Right? If, we, if we're investing in something, it's because we're investing it with the expectation that somebody else will want it. Right? So effectively, it feeds into the marketplace. And you know, it's only only a question of how far we can, how far we do and can follow that product or whatever as it progresses. So what we're looking for is is stuff that is relevant to the pharmaceutical industry, the broader pharmaceutical industry. So what we do is we spend a lot of time working out where the market is is moving, where it's going to, and then working our way back. 
So that's the sort of thing that we're looking for. And there are some things that, that, that are just outside our bandwidth. And I know this is, this is dear to your heart, but you know, a lot of the, you know, a, a big frontier in medicine is going to be CNS, right? CNS is a bitch of an area to be in, <laughs> right? It really is. I mean, how, you know, how long do we have to stay with this fucking thing before we know if it works, right? Phase three, you know, forget it. If we don't know where we are, unless we're in phase three, right, this is not going to be an attractive proposition, yeah. right? And that's, that's just the way, the way it is, because we're a 10-year fund. So we heard about, you know, patient capital, and, and you know, this, this is obviously one of these zeitgeist things, right? It's all about patient capital. And it probably is necessary if you're going to start doing stuff like that now, Alzheimer's fund, the, the, you know, trying to kickstart the whole area. That's fine. But if you look at what we're looking for now, we're looking for stuff that, 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 that we can see translated into something where we, you know, we know it can work or we know it doesn't work much sooner than, than, than those sort of areas. Yeah. So we tend to look for things that we can take a bite out of. Right? So okay. we're looking for bite-sized chunks. There are, there are plenty of those to go around. So, so we're not limited by a number of projects. Right? They're, they're generally there. The issue is actually eyes on the ball. So for us, the, 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 I've never been able to get around the um, sourcing dilemma for new projects that somebody tells me about it. We've gone and camped out in Max Planck, we've gone and camped out, camped out in Pasteur, we've gone and camped out everywhere trying to find projects and it's been really thin. It's not a good return. So all of the projects that we've done that we've, that we've prosecuted have actually come in by a word, via word of mouth. And I've never found out that. That's a hugely inefficient and very patchy thing, right? But that's how they, how they, how they get to us. So I think there are, there are plenty of universities that, that we've been to that we've eventually got things out of that have actually never seen a venture capitalist. And, and talking about universities, what is your experience of you know, TTOs in the different places that you operate. Obviously, you're getting projects at a fairly early stage. They're being spun out of universities. So you have a pretty good perspective of what goes on in France, Switzerland, yeah. uh, you know, UK, US. And so how does the UK rate, or, or how does it compare, if not rate, versus the other, uh, you know, versus the other countries that you operate uh, in? You know, it, it's, it, it, Genghis is saying it's impossible to generalize. I mean, yes. even in the U.S., it's impossible to generalize. Mm -hmm. If you go to either coast, it's fine. You go to the bit in the middle, it's not quite so fine, right? So, you know, and, and it's the same in the U.K., it's the same in Europe. Most of the time, if we can, if we can just do a deal with the, with the, with the academic, right, it'd be much easier, actually, right? We're not out there to rape and pillage. We're just out there to get stuff done, right? And generally, it doesn't help. And, I, and I, all I'll say is this, I've never managed to get anything out of Oxford, ever. Yeah. And I'm not alone. Okay, well we're not Oxford centric. No, we're no, not, exactly. We're not focusing on Oxford, I think but, it's more of a UK related yeah. issue. But I, I agree with you, I mean I think in the US for example, there'll be differences between places like Columbia, MIT, Stanford, exactly. etc. So exactly. there, are, there are differences. But it, I think generally to, speaking, you would say it's pretty hard. It is, it is always, it always harder work than it needs to be. We've done some deals directly with academics. Everybody's gone away happy and we've got it done quickly. Right? I don't know that intermediaries are helping, okay. are helping in this. Okay. So Kevin made an interesting point about the high risk of um, CNS. And so you know, one answer to that, for example, is we have this Dementia Discovery Fund, which GSK and others are uh, funding. Um, and, and that's because, because it's too risky for ordinary venture capitalists to yeah, do. Yeah. Um, and it's a strategic and they're not there to make a financial return, they're tr to try and advance uh, new drugs for dementia. Yeah. Well, we just made a Series A in a company uh, in Switzerland called Aceneuron, which uh, looks for tauopathy and, and some, not Alzheimer uh, initially, because that's, 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 a, that's, I can't remember the term you used, but uh, I wouldn't use that term. Uh, it, but it's, uh, uh, for, you know, tauopathies in general. Uh, PSP is the indication. So, uh, so the question is always looking for indications that, that you think with a relatively small amount of money you can either kill it or go to the next stage. And we, in this particular thing, uh, the amount of corporate interest in that particular target is, is amazing. So, so I think it's all, you know, you say, oh, CNS, you know, just no can do, but then they are within this.
segments where this you can do and you can actually pursue this to even potentially a, a, market, a marketed product because it's a small indication, maybe okay, often to start with, but you could, you know, PSP is, is a lethal disease that is sort of, you know, is an accelerated version of, of Alzheimer's. So if you solve that problem, you know, maybe so you, you can actually derive to, to, to something else. Uh, back on the TTO, I think, uh, <clears throat> sure, in Europe, in general, I mean, it's all sort of about experience that they have in, in the US, and if you go to, to Harvard or, or, or Stanford, there's much more sort of abacus of things that they do. They will tell, tell you, okay, this is what we do. And you, you can't really negotiate that much. This is what we do, period. And uh, while in Europe, it's so much more fluid, and sometimes, you know, we want 10 times more than, than what Harvard would take, and it's just not, not, not possible. So it's, it's, I don't think they do it just because they, they're looking to, to maximize their returns, also because, you know, they don't, they don't they, they, by definition, they see a venture investor, they see a finance guy, and they say, you know, he, he's in there he's to, here to rape me. To rape me, you know, <laughs> so we're going to put the barriers, and, and that's not the case. So, uh, and I think it defeats the object if, if the project doesn't go up to the ground, and we're taking so much huge risk with, with management of this, or, or the academics involved. So I think it's a question of evolution, and I think hopefully things will, will, will get better if you say, hey, this is what you can get from, from Harvard or, or Stanford, and this is, this is what you're offering me, you know, just, you know, just how can you justify that? So, uh, and there's a lot, you know, this experience is building. So we, we you know, we, we, we find it uh, not always easy to discuss with TTOs, but we, we get there. And uh, as, you know, we both uh, getting this experience, I think it's gonna get better. So I don't think it's, I don't think we can accuse, you know, TTOs sort of barriers to, to be uh, the, the reason why, you know, we, we are not uh, uh, more prolific in creating companies. I would say in the UK in particular, and you said we shouldn't offend people, but you told me we should offend people. <laughs> so, you know, monopoly is, is never good for anyone, right? So that's the issue. And when someone has a monopoly, by definition, you know, you, 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 the, the, the price uh, evolution is not, gonna, is not gonna work. So, so anyone who has a monopoly, of course, they're gonna charge twice as much. It's, it's true in any, look at it, anyone who came to France last week, you know, the taxis are losing their monopoly because of Uber. They're unhappy, you know, but they've been abusing everyone for 30 years. So, <laughs> literally. So I, I would, uh, no, I, I would suggest that you know monopolies are not good. Maybe that's not so uh, offensive. Anyway, that's a very nice word. For yeah. So, so, my, so my, uh, well, we're well, just on the, coming to the TTOs. There's another issue we haven't touched on: is how they collaborate or perhaps don't collaborate with each other. E with each other. Right. So this, um, I told you, we're looking at a startup that's a gleam in the professor's eye here in the UK. Um, but the IP is going to come from three different institutions, um, and one of them actually is only just just setting up its TTO, and they are not interested in collaborating with each other, and so it makes it, you know, it's exponentially harder. It's not just three times harder, and so I think, you know, if, if I were to give a message or try and change things, I would get TTOs to talk more to each other. I, I'd be curious to find out. I, I've always had the impression, uh, you know, being here, that in the U.S. There's much less academic balkanization, uh, you know, where each university kind of wants to, you know, hang on to their little patch and, uh, you know, doesn't want to doesn't want to share that with anyone else, etc. Do you do you encounter a lot of that here? I mean, a lot of success in the U.S. has been, you know, multi institutions. Well, research from many institutions being involved sort of best-in-class research from many institutions being involved in the formation of a company. Do you kind of find that there's a bit too much balkanization here with, you know, Oxford saying it's Oxford, Cambridge saying it's Oxford, Imperial saying it's Imperial, et cetera? Well, you know, one of the yes, great... Yes, the answer. Right? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends. One of the great IP disputes coming up is CRISPR and uh, how this gene editing technology, what's the IP around that? Um, and two of the uh, companies, um, CRISPR and Intellia, uh, cross license with, with each other. We're investors in CRISPR therapeutics. And um, the Broad Institute at MIT has given IP to Editas, and they've said, no, we're not interested in cross licensing, and we're going to fight this to the bitter end. I mean, that's an extreme form of balkanization, right. and one of the um, yes. most exciting new technologies that's going to have broad ramifications in, in, in everything that we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and on man managerial talent, I mean, we alluded to that, you know, ever so briefly. Um, do you see, you know, the kind of managerial talent here that, that you need? I mean, a lot of, when you go to British, to, when you go to companies in the U.S., you see a lot of Brits that are either running or at high levels there, so they're obviously not here, they're over there. And there's, some of them are serial entrepreneurs getting involved in many different companies. Why is that not the case here? Why are they not here? 
and why are they over there? I mean, what's your view of that? So I'll, I'll start on this because I told, told you what, what our yeah. mantra was, which is building companies on people. Yeah. So clearly, you know, I, I would argue that this is the right thinking step to, to companies. It's not the science, clearly not the science. And that's, and we, you know, again, it's, you can complain all day long, but then you can look at how, how good you've, you've evolved. And we, you know, we have a lot more of those faces on our walls than we had 20 years back where we were still doing the same job. So we, we can see, but this is a slow process. That's all I'm gonna say. This process, in order to be a repeat entrepreneur, you need to have done something good before, by definition almost. So, so, you know, that process takes, takes some time. Today, where we are right now, there are the talents that, that we didn't have 10 years back. 10 years ago, we had to fish people from pharma who had, yes, development expertise that the academies didn't have, but they had no clue about managing companies. And that, you know, not, every, not everything worked. So now those guys, potentially, those who succeed, succeeded, and then there's some homegrown, you know, people who came from the academy world. So you now have a whole generation of people who've done it once or twice or three times. We have people in our again corridor who, who, who their faces you can see a couple of times or more because because they, they started again. Someone who's, who's been a successful entrepreneur wants to start again. So it's a slow process. If you can get people, um, you know, to you know, the. the if you look at what's happening in China, you mentioned about China, they call them you know, sea turtles, you know, people who've been in, 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 in the US or in Europe for 20 years doing something fabulous in, in any organization coming back. So yeah, we've done that with French people uh, in France, we've done that with uh, Italians in Italy and, and also in the UK. So, and that's, it needs to be a strategy. You know? uh, uh, at JP Morgan, for instance, there was a, uh, because we've been quite successful in Italy for some reason, uh, there, was a, there was a minister of economy saying, you know, we, we want, you know, there's so many Italians or second generation people who are fifth generation Italians in the US. Some of them are in the biotech world, you know, come back to, to Italy. That's the sort of thing you need to do. If you take 10, you know, there's probably several hundred. If you take 10 of them and, and, and bring them to, to the UK, you see the impact that this has on, on an industry that has a, few, a number of dozens of companies. It could be huge. So that's I think, I think pretty you've got simple. To make it, you've got to make it worth a while. Right? Sure. And I speak, I speak of, I've done it myself. Hmm? Right? So you've got to make it worth a while. Um, so you know, if I'd have done my, if I'd applied my trade in the US, I know very well I was, I was accepting a one fifth of what it would otherwise be. Doing this in the UK is about worth about one fifth of what I, I would get if I was doing that in the US. Right? You just got to make it worth a while. And so, so and, and don't give them any sort of the bullshit mission, you know, you're, you're saving the world, because, you know, in reality, you st you're still, you know, you have a choice about where you, can, where you can save the world, right? So it's actually just got to be clear to them that it's worth doing, because actually, it's, it's a hard thing. You, 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 you go out and you, you go out on your own, you're living on your wits, Right? You're inventing, reinventing yourself every day. It's a hard world, right? There's no bloody pension plan or dental in this. This is you're on your own, okay? This is, a, this is, a, this is what it's like, okay? Yeah. So, so it's got to, there's got to be something worthwhile at the end of that. So you're master of your own destiny, but at least make the destiny worthwhile. Yeah. And so, the, so that's, that's basically, and we're, we're basically, the way we're dealing with it is we're growing our own. Do you, do you offer to change the weather? Um, <laughs> That's a bit more difficult, <laughs> but you can, you can choose a microclimate. <laughs> but, but I would argue that in this current climate, you can make it worth your while. And exactly. Sort of governments right now just sort of picked up that startups yep. are important. It's not just about digital you know, and, 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 and internet, but, but the life science are creating something beyond, well beyond that. Yep. And so we certainly see a number of, of uh, I mentioned Italy, it's the same in France, and I, I'm sure it's the same here in the UK. But so with some pretty focused thing, uh, you can actually really create some movement. the other thing is, is, the time, is the time as well, because when I did CAS, then I was there for 13 years, right? I mean, that's like a third or more of my professional life invested in one thing. Mm. So uh, and, and, uh, I've done also an asset-centric thing, which is, which is much shorter timeline, and that's much more compatible with people who are genuinely impatient, like me, right? So, so we're definitely not patient people. So if you've got impatient something... Impatient capital. Impatient capital. I, I actually, I've already trademarked it. Sorry. No, yeah, okay. uh, sorry. That's nice. The, 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 if you give people the, a, a gig that's like three years plus or minus a year, right, this is going to be, this is the gig, um, then you're going to get many more of those per given decade 
And if you give people the incentive to kill the thing if, it doesn't, if it's not yeah. going to play out, because your upside is in the product, if the product isn't there, don't worry about it, right? Just don't sweat it. There are plenty more out there. Right? So if you give people that and then a decent equity stake in the upside, that's, that's our formula. And it, so far, it does seem to be working. Because there's, there, there, there's, uh, I've come across this amongst other VCs, that they think if, you, if, if, the, if one of the entrepreneurs makes out like a bandit, right, they're going to disappear to a tropical island, buy a yacht, right, and you'll never see them again. Right? It doesn't happen. Right? It doesn't happen. It, or it happens so rarely. You do that for six months. And then you do bored. that for six months, you're bored shitless, you've got to come and do something else. Right? And, and, and we bank on that. Right? They'll be back. So we, we have roughly around, I think I'm told by uh, Mallory, about 10 minutes left. Does anybody in the audience want to ask any questions of these august individuals? Um, Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. That is another very important issue. And compared to the big US universities, they're massively underfinanced and under-resourced. So just uh, on this, um, you know, we, we cannot impact that ourselves. Uh, but you know, I think it's, uh, it's, it's true. Um, but if there was no monopoly, you know, then if, if you are basically that, that you know, that, that you're on a rate-limiting step to, to get that IP out for, for something that could be very, very important, then there, should, there has to be another way out uh, so that this, this science and the scientists are not get, do not get stuck. So, you know, uh, you, sh you should try and solve both sides. Ian? I think, Ian, that's an appropriate question, but there's a whole session on TTOs, which that will be addressed, so I think maybe we should leave it to that. Chaz, you had a question, perhaps. Uh, uh, question. Do you think we'll recognize I mean, I'd like to address that at least ever so briefly. I mean, I'm going to be a bit controversial here, and I know somebody's going to shoot me. But, you know, in this university, where there is a, an incredible ecosphere of medical technology being developed across the university uh, and world-class science, when you go to the business school and ask them whether they're going to do anything about creating biotech entrepreneurs, they will tell you, well, we know nothing about, uh, about biotech or pharma. We don't have anything to do about it. Now, that sort of attitude is unfortunately very unhelpful. Um, 
Yeah. You know, there's in Stan if you go to Stanford, yes. uh, there's a, a, a program which they call the biodesign program. You, you must know about that. Yes. And it's basically they put people from you know, the medical school, the, the business school, the engineering school together. They, it's a small group of 15 people and it's amazing. And they have like maybe 15 years of track record and it's amazing what they managed to do. So it's not the magic bullet, but uh, bringing those, th those skill sets together with the right mentorship on top just makes a miracle. Uh, so that's... Mina, know, you have a comment? Yeah, I, I, I slightly actually disagree with the, uh, the comment about the sort of uh, helping entrepreneurs, particularly in Oxford. I think it is the case that the machinery is not existent. We have to acknowledge that, but we also have to acknowledge the fact that it is a change. From my perspective, in, in less than 14, 15 month time, we've received a lot of support from the university, from the business school, from the educational centre in particular. But because it's quite new, I think it was the case that people can... <coughs> No, I think the best way of doing this is just do it. Uh, leader, perhaps, do it. Uh, yeah. leaders from MIT. I have a question. One of the big differences between the bigger U.S. schools and the British schools is we kick the companies out almost immediately. As soon as they get incorporated, <coughs> everything else stops. I mean, the professor may still have grants and continue his research. But he doesn't go, he doesn't run the company. He's not the CEO. He's a founder. Whereas British companies incubate inside, sometimes to the point of <coughs> living inside, with a CEO often being a faculty member. Yeah. Would you like to? But that's, I think that's, I mean, it's like, if you want to know how to swim and you, you're on the side and you put your foot in, in the swimming pool, you know, you're not going to learn to swim. So what you, you, yours is pretty radical. Just throw them in there and see if they can survive, which uh, is certainly one way of doing it. And, of course, and it has been very successful for MIT. The postdoc or graduating PhD goes over to the company. Yeah. Oh, that's, that yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the way it works. I mean, we, uh, we uh, uh, you know, there's... Uh, well, I'm not going to say anything that we, but yeah, so I, I agree. No, I think we have no, time no, for no, one no, more no, question. No. Over there. So I think it, there is this analogy. I think we say very little about the seeds that we do, but do we do shout about the success that we have? So that I think, because the success is not just about boasting; it's about uh, it's about also creating uh, the the the, uh, the model for all the other guys. And I think that has worked in in most uh, jurisdiction. Let's say you know if you have you know an actelian, just just brag about this and try and and, and get you know for one company that succeeds. You know there's at least you know. 100 that don't, but maybe by, by talking about this, how, how did you do that? Maybe 10 will actually come out of that. So I think that's, uh, and if I were a TTO, I would certainly, uh, you know, be able to do that. You know, the, the, there's, there's a big move in the technology world at the moment, which is disintermediation. So you take out the middleman. And I'm just, all, all, all through this conversation, I'm just telling you what I'm thinking. I'm just thinking it's just right for disintermediation. By the way, that's what the pharma thinks as well. They think they can disintermediate us. Uh, oh, yeah, no, no. no, no. <laughs> it's true. And, 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 but it's okay. And, you know, so, you, so you compete on your merits. I mean, I mean I, I, they, they are competing yeah. more and more with you because yes. they are getting involved, as, uh, uh, you know, as was said earlier today, they are getting involved in academia yeah. and, and forming companies, et cetera, et cetera. But 
Uh, to be fair, the corporate venture capital arms of the companies are working with you on yeah, various yeah. companies. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a healthy competition in a sense. Mm. Uh, and at the end of the day, they still do need capital to develop these companies and they will come to you eventually, I suspect. Um, maybe one last question. I don't think that anyone's suggesting that we should lose TTO structure. TTOs have a, a function to perform in a university because academics won't know how to patent or what is patentable, et cetera. So. Yes, no, absolutely. So. Oh. <laughs> They're teddy bears. Okay, animals. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> You know, I will tell you something. Our life depends on it. Now, it's true, you know. Our life depends on us being able to, you know, to raise another fund and, and be there. If, you know, this firm that I'm in has been there for 40 years. And we're not there because, you know, for altruism. We're there because we get money from LPs and we need to give them a return. That is our mandate. Okay, so it's not, we're not nasty just for the sake of it. <laughs> <laughs> we going with this one okay, we enjoy it. No, <laughs> no, we just you know it's we but you know we, we take things that are so risky. We need to make a buck. We we see we, we are we investing in this thing. We have no idea. There's this tunnel. We, we don't know if it's one kilometer, ten kilometers, or if it's just a, you know a dead end. So you know yes, we, we need to. This is where we make our return. Is is when we do the investment. After that. You know, for all those of you uh, who have collaborated with any of us, you will see that we are collaborative. We are not cutthroat. When we, when we are on the same side of the table, we have to. We have to align ourselves. In fact, the returns that we do, it's not us. It's the entrepreneurs that are, and it's not just, you know, cheesy what I'm saying. This is the truth. We have to align ourselves with the management because that's our best way to make the return. So yes, we do, you know, negotiate a hard bargain on, at the beginning, but, you know, because our life depends on it, and then when we are in that boat, then we are very collaborative until, of course, you know, if something really goes wrong and we can see the coast and us, you know, accelerating towards it, then, then we'll have to do something. I, th I think, uh, David, it's also a question. We're trying to negotiate a deal that makes sense. And for a TTO, there's a balance. They want, the universities are public funded, but the TTO is there to help the university make uh, money. That will help it in the future, too. And you can have universities with huge endowments. And there's a balancing act. And the point I was making earlier is I think in the UK, on average, the balancing act is too much. The TTOs are over-concerned about their return on investment and less concerned about getting the technology to the market as far as possible. So I think that that balance isn't quite right. Okay, on that note, um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my panel for the vigorous discussion which they've given us and the audience for the question. <laughs> okay, wow, this is terrific. Um, we have um, our luncheon speaker here, well, kind of here. Um, he was, he's not able to actually, do we have him? He's not actually able to join us here live, but he is live uh, because there are votes in Parliament today, which he has to be at. I'm, I'm learning all about Parliament. There's something called a three-line whip or something, which means they have to be there. And he is going to be there because but we'll have him here live on the screen in a few seconds. Um, do we have him? Not yet, no. We've only got you on screen. But he is in the studio. 
And, he, and it will be two ways. And then there will be a lunch right outside there. You'll all have about an hour for lunch. We still don't have it up? It's maybe a minute or two more. This is going to be.
I can hear you, yeah. I can hear you. Well, thank you. I'm sorry I can't be with you today in Oxford for this important and exciting event. I love the title, The Pulse of British Bioscience. It's a chance for me to remind uh, you that the first line of the job description the Prime Minister gave me as the UK's first Minister for Life Science
is to develop broader policy landscape for the biosciences in the UK and for the women economy. I want to put it to you that we live in an age of extraordinary breakthroughs in biosciences and years of medicine, uh, food and agriculture, energy, and a whole range of supportive industrial disciplines which will support the sustainable development across the globe. The big one within that, uh, for us particularly here in the UK, is biomedicine. And that's my day job as the UK's first minister for life sciences. When we set out the life science strategy in 2011, the prime minister was very clear that we envisage uh, healthcare as both a major strategic uh, challenge and opportunity for the UK. With an aging society, a million more pensioners this year than we had five years ago, exploding demand for health care services in the UK. Health is the biggest driver of the structural deficit. That bit of the UK structural deficit that grows quicker than our economy grows. And to tackle that, we have to unleash the power of bioscience and technology into our medical system, our NHS, to drive transformation of our health system uh, in a way that makes the UK a global destination to develop those technologies. So we want to shift the agenda from uh, traditional life sciences viewed as a pharmaceutical industry sponsored by the Department of Business here, uh, with an integrated strategy with uh, our health economy, the NHS, pumping as a second cylinder, supporting 21st century research, pumping in the informatics, the access to clinical trials infrastructure, genomics, which is transforming 21st century biopharmaceuticals, research focused back on patients and diseases, but also to tackle the systemic uh, challenge in the UK that the NHS has traditionally uh, led, the, led the world in pioneering new breakthroughs but has been slower in recent years in adopting those innovations. So uh, my strategy here uh, can be divided really into four major work streams. On genomics, the Prime Minister announced that we would lead the world in being the first nation on earth to sequence the entire genome of NHS patients, 100,000 genomes at scale, and combine that data with NHS phenotypic data to create what I call the NASA of biomedicine, the world's largest and most powerful reference library for doing genomic um, medicine, and crucially, to launch that in and with the NHS from day one. And I'm really pleased that NHS England have launched now 13 genomics medicine centers. So we're mainstreaming genomic diagnosis and treatment right at the heart of 21st century NHS. Uh, we predict that the UK genomics market, the two big figures suggest it'll be 20 billion by 2018. And we're determined that the UK lead in both the core technologies behind sequencing and that sequencing revolution, but also in the adoption of genomic diagnosis and medicines into the NHS. The second major area for our strategy is informatics. We won't unleash the power of genomic medicine and informatics in precision medicine and identifying better which patients respond to which drugs in which ways without really unlocking the power of informatics in our NHS. A properly unleashed, the NHS could be the world's largest engine for 21st century research. Indeed, that was its original covenant back in 1947. Research sits right at the heart of that mandate. And to bring it alive for the 21st century, we have to unleash the power of informatics
What can we do to reform or assessment and adoption approval of innovations? 21st century NICE uh, needs to be able to make judgments about much more targeted medicines using data in real time, in real patients, with real disease, in real places. Uh, a whole new toolbox of adaptive licensing, condition approvals, new pathways, so we can fast track those innovations that we know will benefit certain patients into use in that patient segment much more quickly. And thirdly, how can we knock over the barriers and incentivize much quicker uptake of innovation across our health economy? The fourth major program for me is making sure that all of this work supports UK growth, investment, company creation, job creation, and wealth creation. This is about health and wealth in a mature democracy. And I'm delighted that the news is very positive. We launched the UK Life Science Strategy. We've attracted over £6 billion inward investment into the UK and 16,000 jobs secured. And we've achieved now over £5 billion of exports into the emerging markets of our life and health sciences technologies. And the uh, funding gap for emerging companies which has uh, dominated for the last 10 years is closing. Last year in the UK we raised over £1.6 billion for early stage companies. The FTSE healthcare index up 15% uh, compared to the main market down. And at this year's second London Stock Exchange healthcare conference, which I opened on Wednesday of last week, I was announcing major new figures of early investment and celebrating the fact that last year we had in Circassia uh, a record financing round and the UK early stage financing in the life sciences back to a 17 year high. Lots more still to do but I think we are laying the foundations for a long term and sustainable period of growth which is what led Deloitte this year to signal that the UK is becoming one of the world's three great clusters for 21st century life science. It's going to be a much more uh, integrated and uh, multidisciplinary landscape with digital diagnostics, devices, drugs combining to make possible new treatments. Data will become the oil of this new engine and it will require us to fundamentally integrate research in our clinical environment. Uh, and in that context, the National Institute of Health Research, our billion pound a year clinical infrastructure at the heart of the NHS, is I think the UK's jewel in the crown. I'm incredibly proud to be the minister for this quiet revolution and, and delighted to see that Oxford is playing a key role in it, both in the deep science and in, in hosting some of our most exciting companies and in the work that the team at the Radcliffe and the Academic Health Science Network and the university are doing to make sure these technologies impact in the local health economy. I close just by making this observation. If this extraordinary revolution of technology is to really uh, make a difference, we need to make sure that it's led by inspired clinicians on behalf of their patients and inspired local health economy leaders who will demonstrate that technology adoption supports transformation of our health system for patient benefit. And I think with disease leadership and place leadership, we will be able to make sure that the UK leads in this new landscape of 21st century life science. And I'm delighted that today's conference is addressing a number of those issues. There was talk of questions and I'm I've got five minutes. I'm very happy to take questions if the technology will support it. I can hear you now. I can hear you now.
OK, I, I couldn't hear the first question, but I heard, Mallory, your repeat of it. Thank you. I think the question was about the SMART program. I, I just say, when I was uh, an investor in the sector and starting companies as an entrepreneur, the SMART program was one of the best programs. It was clear. It was simple. It was uh, properly structured, um, small, medium, and large-scale funding. And that informed a lot of my thinking in designing the Biomedical Catalyst program. I just say this, um, through a very difficult funding round this autumn, I think you can see the Chancellor has signalled strong support for this sector. Here at the Department of Business, we are conducting a review at the moment into the various business support schemes, and I will be doing everything I can to make sure that we uh, maintain uh, a very clear structure for providing focused support for emerging technologies and companies in that space. We want to make sure that it's industry-led uh, and that it has a tangible and practical benefit. But we also want to make sure that we're here to support de-risking and helping transformational technologies come through from laboratory to clinic. I'm sorry, I only heard the tail end of that, Mallory. I missed the question. Well, I think there's two aspects to this. We need to make sure that we are supporting the technologies and the science training and skills pipeline for the UK sector and making sure that students here in the UK have got access to the very best training and uh, skills program. And there's some important work going on, not least in the field of clinical science, where traditionally we made it quite difficult for uh, people wanting to build a career in clinical science. We, we tend to ask our young academics to be either academic or clinicians, and we need to make it easier to build a career uh, in that clinical science space and we recognize that we're short in one or two key areas um, informatics is one and the uh, clinical pathology molecular diagnostics um, uh, genetic epidemiology some of these new disciplines that are becoming so key we also need to make sure we are open for international uh, learning and training and one of the pro programs I'm looking at is how we can bring more global clinical science trainees into our NIHR infrastructure to give us more capacity to generate revenue from training and to make the UK National Institute for Health Research the global gold standard in clinical science. I'd like it to be like a, a Nuffield scholarship, a Rhodes scholarship, anybody globally in clinical science recognizing it as a as a gold kite mark. Um, well, let me just say this. I, I, ha, having, designed, having designed the Biomedical Catalyst, I think you would expect me to be a great supporter of it. And 
I think the evidence is that it played a really important part in that um, landscape in 2011 and 12, when the sector was uh, in something of the doldrums, it helped to catalyze a lot of activity and it's played a part uh, in helping to generate some of those numbers I just talked about in terms of early stage financing. In the review of funding mechanisms, uh, we, we need to be cognizant of the fact that public money needs to be used where it is most precious and valuable and can have maximum impact. And we're looking at the moment, working with the Treasury on where and how an ongoing catalyst program uh, could and should be um, designed to have maximum impact. And I'm looking at the whole landscape to try and see where the most acute funding gap is today and where some targeted intervention uh, on that catalyst model could have most um, most impact. It's a pleasure. I believe in technology. Um, have a good day.
I'm based at the well actually I'm at halfway between London and Cambridge. But I'm definitely coming from that part. I'm not from there. Yes, it's not from this part.
downhill slide now.
Can I have your attention? Can we get you all seated? We are already running behind schedule. By the way, I'm, I, am, I am told that this conference is one of the largest, not the largest of its type, in Oxford ever, people's memory, but more important than that, we have people from 14 countries as delegates here. I am just amazed. Can we just get you all seated as quickly as possible? Did we lose uh, Mark Schoenbaum again? He was getting a cup of coffee. Maybe he's getting, okay. Our next session 
is one of the most interesting sessions. Let's get seated. Can I have your attention, please? We want to get the shh. Thank you. So oh, Mark, when you enter, everybody, everybody's quiet. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to we're going to take a look at something right now that I just think is vital. Um, and it's really what I call the, a view from the front lines. Um, what does the finance industry tell us about the viability and profitability of U.S. bioscience? And to lead this discussion is one of the most knowledgeable guys. He's a graduate biochemist with a post with postgraduate research experience in seed biology. Started his career 30 years ago as a science and technology editor working for a chemical industry focused publication. Today he's the global director of content for both Data Monitor Healthcare and the Script Group of Pharma and MedTech industry focused publications. I am thrilled that he was, he's agreed to convene this session. Um, I turn you over to Mike Ward. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, Mallory. When Mallory called me, uh, I was at the JP Morgan meeting, uh, and it was like really early in the morning. Um, I, was, I can't remember whether I'd just come in from a party or I was going out to a party. Um, and one of, yeah, and, and one, of the, one of the things he, he sort of said to me, he said that, you know, the, the, so the focus of this meeting was to, uh, you know, to look at why UK science is so great but why does it really, really struggle to you know, get it into the marketplace? And I thought, in the 30 years that I've been covering this industry, every decade, we've actually asked these questions, and we come up with some answers, and clearly we got them wrong, uh, because we're still here. And it was really, really interesting to hear some of the sort of discussions this morning, and I think that um, what we're going to do now is we're going to hear from from guys who are looking at it from a slightly different perspective. They've been looking at it from the point of view of where the, the real deep pools of capital are. So, so this morning we, we heard with the venture capitalists, you know, the kind of money that those guys put to work is about $10 billion a year. Whereas in fact, the, you know, really to get this, um, this industry oiled, it requires you know, much larger amounts of capital. And these guys, are the, 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 have been very much involved in you know, looking at the companies, deciding or helping people decide where that money should be put. Um, and it's not a surprise that uh, two of them are based in the States, and uh, my third uh, panelist spent a lot of time in the States, um, because this industry, <laughs> this industry does speak with an American accent, and what no, we're hoping to we, learn... We have no accent. Yeah. We have. Yeah. <laughs> you just say that again. This is like the J.P. Morgan meeting where everyone talks funny. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to, um, you know, look at sort of, you know, how these guys are actually sort of viewing the industry, and sort of, you know, what lessons can can we learn um, from, you know, I guess where, you know, where all the action is. So what I'll actually ask you to do first is I'll ask each of them just to give a sort of a brief introduction of, you know, uh, their, uh, their sort of track record and, 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 you know, who they are, what they do. And, and then once Matthew has, actually we'll start with Matthew doing the in introductions sure. and then Matthew's then going to uh, do a, a small presentation just to sort of give you some uh, background in terms of what the, um, uh, the sort of the finance market has looked for for biotech uh, in, in recent years. So Matthew, if, you, if you'd like to kick off. Yeah, sure. Perfect. Thanks. So I'm Matthew Harrison. I cover um, biotechnology for Morgan Stanley. Um, and um, because everybody asked, my, I'm, my academic background is actually particle astrophysics and not bio, biochemistry or anything. But anyway, so, um, so I'm a transplant of sorts. But um, what I thought I'd do, and, and might get asked, so I have a couple slides just to give you um, some idea of what the public markets have been doing for the past couple of years as well as sort of what, what we look for. So the first couple of slides are just to give you sort of an idea of new um, biotech IPO and follow-on activity. So these are just total number of deals. So it's just numbers from 2000. You can see 
2000 was sort of the last peak. It wasn't it was choppy um, up until about 2012, and then we took off in 2014 and 2015. Have been very strong years for new new issuance as well as follow-ons and follow-ons when companies that are already public um, raise money again. And so then this gives you the dollar value. So again, the last, um, and these are by quarters actually, so if you look at the six billion in first quarter of 14, you know, there's been a massive amount of capital um, raised in the industry in 14 and 15. And again, these are biotech only. Um, and, and then this just gives you an idea, and this is more of a banker slide than a research slide, but um, you can see the difference between private valuations and public valuations. So the number on the top is the step up between when the company was private and when they became public. So for the past, um, this is for the past about um, year. And so you can see what's happened in the last, you know, four to five months, the biotech market um, has started, and healthcare in general has started to not be as strong as it was over the past couple of years. And so you can see the step up, which you know in the past was maybe one and a half to two times, is contracted down the you know less than one and a half times from um, private to public valuation. And then just to give you some some more perspective on you know returns, because that's what that's what we care about. Um, these are cohorts of IPOs. So this is 2012, 2013, 2014, and 2015 looking at their performance from when they came on the market till now. And you can see the, the cohort of 2015 IPOs is actually below um, their initial value now as a group as the biotech market in general has, has turned. Um, and so then I put this together just to give some perspective. This is, and these are US listings to be clear. So this is not European based listings, but in total, so from 2000 to 2015, there's been $116 billion of biotech capital raised. Of that, 5% has been for European-based companies that have listed in the U.S. Um, that's 894 total deals, of which 260 are new companies. 6% um, of the new companies are European-based, and 3% of the total dollars, I mean, of the total deals are European-based. And then you know, when I go back and look at the numbers, about a third of that is from the UK. Um, and so then just in terms of what, you know, and I'm sure Mark will, will have some, some good comments here as well. So, you know, in terms of what public investors look for, right, I would say there are two kinds of things public investors look for. So the one is sort of the big ideas. And, you know, these might be gene therapy or CRISPR or immuno-oncology. Um, and I think public investors are willing to start earlier on these big ideas because they know the market opportunity is very large. But the offset to that is when the markets turn, and the reason I put this chart in here is these are gene therapy companies, um, and most of them had recently gone public. You can see that, you know, as the markets turn, the big idea stocks are the ones that go down first um, because they're still a long time off from the market. Um, and so public investors tend to be a bit fickle with these. And so you can see the performance of these stocks is down about 60% since when they came on the market. Um, and so that's sort of the susceptibility to big ideas. The, the other thing, you know, that, that investors, so, so, so you've got big ideas on one side and then on the other side you've got this sort of something that's more mature, which is we've got phase two data, we understand what the profile looks like. Um, and we understand what the regulatory path is, and that's something we can value and then decide how much we want to pay for it given the level of risk that it is. The offset to that is what we're not really interested in are therapeutic areas where we know there is significant market pressure. So this might be, you know, for example, a, a, a primary care market that is got a lot of generic drugs and you're trying to develop an incremental drug which might be good for patients above that will have little pricing power, high competition, and high development costs. And so from a public markets perspective, it's not a project people are that excited about. Um, and so, or if you're a very early product and you don't have a lot of de-risking data, again, something that the public markets, I think, is less enthusiastic about. Um, and then I think the other thing maybe relevant also for, for this crowd, maybe more so, is that um, public market investors um, don't really like when you partner the asset early because it takes away our upside potential. And so why I think a lot of um, 
you know, early companies look at big pharma validation or big pharma partnership deals as a way to get capital into their company. For a public market investor, that caps our upside. And so there is a push and pull from that. Um, but in general, I think that makes public investors less enthusiastic unless the market opportunity is, you know, substantially huge. Um, so that's sort of the background just from a public market perspective and we can keep going. Great, Matthew. So, so, so Mark, would you um, just give us a little, little your background? Sure. Um, I'm from Iowa, which is a land far, far away. <laughs> um, Better the news this week. You, How far back do you want to go? Because I can. Uh, He's got a combine. But back. anyway, I'm from Iowa. I, uh, I, I, after, after you replaced um, a Tim. Yes. <laughs> uh, I studied music as an undergraduate and then realized I couldn't feed myself. Went to medical school at Johns Hopkins, then realized I didn't really enjoy that too much, then lived on a couch and got a job as an analyst because that's what people live on couches do. Right. In, the, in the States, at least. <laughs> And, um, and you're also being very modest because you have the grand slam of being the number one analyst in just about everything you cover. I'm the number one analyst in my wife's mind, yes. Yeah. That's exactly right. <laughs> yes. Well, I slipped to number two this year, but it's a long story. Okay. So, uh, so you, can, you, you, can, you can read Mark's biog in the book. He's clearly been very coy. But I cover biotechnology, which I've done for 16 years. I've also covered the major what we call in the States the major pharmas, which the analog here may be Glaxo and AstraZeneca, those sort of stuff. I've, I've done that for the last four or five years as well. And I cover all market caps, although over the last uh, uh, 10 years, my focus has been more, more, more on the bigger companies, but my company was acquired recently, and so we, uh, my mandate has changed, and now I'm very active in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the smaller companies as well. Okay, so, and Tim? Yes, um, my name's Tim Wilson, and uh, for many years, I was a Wall Street biotech analyst. Um, I think in the, the era of the, uh, the blind, leading the blind, uh, back in 1992 when I began, people didn't know what a p-value was, they didn't know what a phase two trial was, how it was different than phase one, etc., etc. So it was really a, a missionary job. Um, I left um, in 2002 to be replaced by my colleague here on the left um, to um, go into investment banking and did that for a number of years and then um, most recently uh, I'm uh, setting up a, an immuno-oncology um, spin-out of uh, Imperial College. So mm -hmm. I've seen everything from the uh, large public market all the way through to one man and his dog, which is what I'm doing at the moment. I think I'm here to represent the grey vote, the, the, the has-been vote, the old Turk vote and other phrases such as back in the day and old school. That's me. I think we can both refer to Matt as boy. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> I'm just jealous. I'm just jealous. Actually, I, I remember what somebody sort of saying that the, the, the best way to, to get the, the uh, support in the biotech was every seven years you have a cull of the analysts and you have the young ones who don't remember what went before and actually think, <laughs> actually think that gene therapy is a good thing. That's right. That's why we had a four-year cycle, yeah. because that was the time. I remember too much, and I actually have PTSD. PTSD. That's usually a... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so this morning, we, 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 were, we heard um, that there is the capital, that, that there is the science, um, but maybe, um, how do I put this politely, some of the processes for actually getting that stuff out of universities into the marketplace isn't as efficient or as optimal as it could be. The UK is home to two world pharmaceutical companies, <laughs> world-class pharmaceutical companies, uh, it does create biotech companies and raise more money from VCs than any other part of, of, of Europe, mm -hmm. and also had a big, big part in the development of what is now the world's best-selling drug. So what, it'd be really interesting to understand, you know, sort of what is the definition of success. That's what I was thinking this morning, because in some respects, that could be seen as success. So. From where you're sitting, and you're, when you're looking at sort of you know, biotech and small pharmaceutical companies, what actually are the attributes for you know, a successful company, one that you think is investable? So, uh, Mark, do you want, do you want to kick I mean, up? like Matt said, it can, it can vary. Um, like, for example, just yesterday, uh, there was this uh, relatively successful IPO uh, that priced in the States uh, called Editas. 
this is a gene editing company. Um, they have no drugs. Nothing will come to market for at least, I think, five, five years or so. But it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a technology that, that many view as revolutionary. So sometimes it's just a technology, and it's hard to see exactly what the drug will be. But I'd say most of the time um, in the public markets, there needs to be some sort of visibility, like what Matt said, into the, in, into the product itself. It can't just be a dream. Back in 2000 in the States when we were clearly in a bubble, and we can argue about whether or not we have been in a bubble the last few years, but clearly in 2000, you just needed an idea. And that idea uh, got funding. As long as the idea made sense, you know, people like this man say it made sense. Uh, the public markets have become much more discerning. Uh, that ebbs and flows, but still I'd say more discerning than over 2000. Typically now, you need visibility on a product, typically, but there have been significant exceptions. And there are other companies that one could argue started the cycle of bullishness uh, three, four years ago that did not have uh, much or any clinical data, like Bluebird, which has been very successful in the States. Um, a sort of gene therapy company. You've had a company called Agios, which really had very little clinical data, but it was led by a famous Genentech scientist. So I'd say if you're going to get, if you're going to go to the public markets without a drug for which there is a p-value from some sort of trial, you probably need um, to be in the club, as we, as I think about it. You've got to have the right venture capital investors. You've got to have the right backers. You've got to have prestigious names associated with it. Um, typically is, is, the, uh, is the rule. If you have a drug that has data that one can study, then the markets don't mind so much. They look at the data. We're all trained to do that. We get things wrong all the time. At least I do. Matt doesn't, but I get things wrong all the time. But you look at the data, you analyze it, and you make a decision. What's the probability of success? And the probability of success then uh, uh, leads directly to kind of an implied valuation for what you'd pay right now. Okay. And... Does it really matter? I mean, you sort of say that you've got to be in the right club. Do you actually have to be in the right locale? I mean, does it matter if you're not in the, the, the north east of, of, of the state? No, it doesn't matter so much. Um, if, what I mean by club is like, uh, it, and again, this is more important if you don't have clinical data with a p-value, right? If it's just an idea, then you need, I found at least, you typically need um, an, an endorsement of people that are viewed as smart money, so to speak, as we call it in the States. And there are dozens of these places. Third Rock uh, on the venture side, I don't mean to spare somebody I don't mention. There, there are many of them. Also, what's become quite common in the States in the last, I'd say, three years is an explosion of what's called crossover funding. Or me it used to be called mezzanine rounds, but crossover funding is, I guess, a sexier because you can just write an X, right? So it's like sexy or something. So crossover funding is essentially where um, a company comes to an investor, usually a public equity investor, that, cro uh, 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 that can cross over into the private sphere. And there's maybe 15, 20 of these shops, and they're viewed as very smart. Whether you agree or not, we can. that's for another session, not over beers. But they're very smart. And if you successfully complete a crossover round, that's viewed as an endorsement that the IPO will get done because A, these people are really smart, B, they're investing in something illiquid, theoretically, and C, they're committed to investing in the IPO as well. So that's a, the quickest way to get into the club. Now that has dried up very recently. We'll see what happens. I think your question, I took your question to mean is there a ge geographical <laughs> hindrance? Does capital move west to east. So if there is a hot new company that goes public in Europe, and I'm running billions in Boston, New York, San Francisco, is the fact that it's not a uh, San Francisco or Boston based company could put me off? And I think the answer is uh, quite a lot of the time yes. And I spent the latter half of my career as an analyst being a missionary here saying, look what they do in America, isn't it great? Why, why don't we get some of that action and look at the data this way and approach your portfolio that way. And I had some success, but it was, it was pushing water uphill. And I think one of the reasons that American investors are somewhat reticent to uh, purchase securities of companies, biotech companies in Europe is they're worried about uh, uh, how that market is going to react to uh, mostly bad news, but sometimes good news as well. Uh, there is clearly less expertise in the public 
markets over here than there is over there. And I think, therefore, also they're concerned about the depth of the well of capital available. If there is a blow-up or if there is a rumour, it can just be, it can be a Yahoo chatbot, as we all infamously know. Right? If you have a deeper pool of capital, it's a more liquid market and there tends to be a more uh, uh, efficient pricing of that asset. So if you've got 700 local stocks in front of you, i.e. USA stocks and NASDAQ, North American call it, okay, it's harder to, to, to make that leap of faith, even, unless you've got a company that's just you know, unique in the world. I just, I, the only thing I'd add to that is that you've seen a trend, at least in the last year, where you've seen either companies that are listed in Europe do U.S. listings or skip the European listing and just do the U.S. listing. And, and the major reason, I think, for that is, is probably twofold. So one, typically European-based biotechs have lower market caps, which means they have a lower free float, which means it's harder to get a position if you're a U.S. investor, and then it's harder to get out if you want to get out. Um, and so without the depth of liquidity, that's an issue for people. And then the second thing is um, a lot of U.S. investors don't want to purchase non-U.S. dollar denominated stocks because they don't want to deal with the currency risk. Mm -hmm. And so if you list in the U.S., you avoid those two issues. Sure. Right. Okay. So, But they don't really care where you're based. You can be right. based in France. You can be based in the U.K. You can be based in San Francisco. You can be based in China. Yeah. It's more about the market yeah. where they can buy the stock. Okay. I mean, there are successful companies based everywhere now, even in Iowa. Yeah. New, yeah. New Link, right. okay. $2 billion company. So. So, okay, so, so um, I'm sort of going to sort of touch on that. But I just want to remind the audience, okay, that we have an opportunity to um, interrogate these guys. So, you know, the lighting's pretty good here. Um, so I, I should be able to see if you, if you wave. And do we have a, a, a mic? If we don't, um, you'll just have to shout, and then I'll repeat the question just in case uh, nobody can hear it. But to, to, to come on, on the point of... For example, uh, companies listing in the States, okay? Um, this morning, um, uh, breathlessly, there was a description right, of successes, UK successes, and uh, two of the three Oxford-based successes that were mentioned was uh, uh, a company called Adaptimmune and a company called Immunicore. Um, what, now, the thing is, is that, you know, Tim and I are so, so old that we actually remember uh, Adaptive Immune Immunicore started life as a T-cell uh, receptor spin-out from Oxford University, in spite of Oxford University, um, called Avidex. And they really, really struggled to, to raise money. Um, they sort of went cap in hand. Eventually were acquired by a German biotech company called Medigene. After a few years, Medigene's board spat that out um, because the, uh, and also got rid of the CEO by saying, you know, who wants to get involved in this sort of, this mad technology? Um, but to give James Noble, uh, who's the, uh, the CEO of Adaptimmune, his, uh, his due, he, he stayed true with the faith and went to the States and got his, his funding, his, his Series A, he got from the US, and then he did, uh, he floated on, on, on the NASDAQ. The question is, would his best bet have been to have gone to the States? And would you recommend that actually, if you really want to, to build a scalable business, not just get a bit of VC, but actually really want to build a business, you actually have to uh, up sticks and put your, you know, put your tent up in, in, in the US? Tim, do you want to start? Yeah, and well, then, and then... it's very topical for me right now because we could, the company that I'm involved with is, is very early and we could do this in Boston or Houston or San Francisco or um, London, Cambridge or Oxford. Um, and we've decided to do it here, not just because we like BBC Two and warm beer and cricket, um, which I'll explain later, um, <laughs> but the ball is allowed to go behind you. Um, but simply put, I think you have now, after 27 years uh, of doing this, I can say you do have now the critical mass of talent uh, that is comparable to what you'd find in Boston or San Francisco. It's all smaller, it's all lesser than uh, uh, those places, but it's still a critical mass. Um, you have 
uh, government initiatives such as help with R&D tax credit, patent box, they're profoundly compelling, believe me, when you're spending your own money. It's not other people's money, it's your money. So every pound counts. Uh, that really helps, I think, as an, as an incentive. And when you tell uh, American colleagues or, or entrepreneurs what that really means and what the, uh, the rules are, they, you know, they, they <laughs> when can I set up in the UK? So I think that's really, really good. I'm still, if I was back to your question, if I was James a few years ago, uh, would I have just upped and off? I, I, I know James very well, and I think it went through his mind <laughs> more than once. Um, I think that uh, the disappointment comes with the public markets, not the private. I think on the VC side, uh, and even on the angel side now, lots of things have improved massively over the last three years, let alone ten years. The public uh, market side, with one or two notable exceptions who we all know, has been massively disappointing. And I think that's perhaps the biggest question in my mind, um, and maybe everybody else's mind, is why is that? I think the answer is that you can't legislate for where people should invest. You can't tell people to go and do something. You can uh, uh, try, but it doesn't work, right? Picking winners and trying to centrally manage an economy is not a very good idea. I think we'd all agree, or most of us would agree. So uh, the city hasn't made enough money. The European public markets in general haven't made enough money in this industry. And we can't bemoan that fact. We've all been sat on couches doing this little gig for... 30 years, 20 years, and it's, it's just a fact. I do think, however, that because of changes on the private side, because of improvements in the quality of companies, the quality of managements that are coming forward, maybe we're in a phase where they will go public on NASDAQ, but there will come a time, just as things have never been better in Europe, uh, there will come a time where finally our European capital markets do justice to the companies that we create, and we won't have to go across the Atlantic. The, the only thing I would add, and this may be, I offer this as not um, an educated, uh, researched view, but it's something that I've just heard, and many, I'd say many Americans um, uh, suspect this is the case, but I'd love feedback from, from you guys. Um, and there's this sense that, that in the, one of the reasons that the, U, the United States the, in, in the U.S., the venture capital community, uh, the venture capitalists are so well-funded most of the time, uh, there's all this company creation, is, isn't because we do better science than, than you, you do, or AstraZeneca does, or Glaxo does, or whoever could spin up, but, there's a, but outside the U.S., there's a cultural barrier for scientists to leave academia and join startups. And I know this is the case in Japan, from personal experience. I know in certain uh, continental European countries, this is a big problem. I'm not entirely clear if that's still an issue here. I meet physicians, as I used to sort of kind of be one, my wife is one, that, that uh, you know, I, I have these conversations where they say, well, it's just so prestigious to be a physician. Still, in the UK, I couldn't imagine, you know, going to the dark side. In the States, it's no longer terribly prestigious to be a physician, and, um, which is horrible, but, and so there's, there, there, it's, it's, it's well accepted to move to industry, and that can often be considered a step up. So I don't know if that has something uh, to do with it, um, sort of a cultural um, uh, mindset that moving to industry is evil. Um, I think the Swiss don't have that, but uh, other, others do. I've always wondered about that. I mean, if you're, if you're in San Francisco and you're at a startup, that's cool. People want to have, have coffee with you and warm beer. And I think that's really part of it. I don't know why that's the case in the States, and I, and I don't know exactly what it's like here, but I'd be curious to chat with some of you about that, and if, if, if that hypothesis is correct, how, you, how, how, how that gets rectified. Can I just tweak that slightly? Yeah. In my own experience is, for what it's worth, it's all about risk acceptance and mm -hmm. risk toler tolerability. So, as you said, in San Francisco, it's cool to be a... Well, actually, in London, particularly on the tech side, uh, the generation below our August generation are fantastically entrepreneurial, fantastically risk accepting. It's all exciting, it's all upside, which is wonderful. You want people to think like that. I think that um, because biotech and the life sciences in general was in the doghouse for so long, there's a tendency, I heard it from a panel member this morning, and I, I, I think he's dead right, 
to, to sort of become browbeaten and oh my god this is all going to fail it's so risky and da 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 well whilst you're all moaning about that the biggest thing I learned going to New York in 1992 is whilst you're setting out the 27 reasons why this thing might fail I'm going to go and do it and then we'll know why don't we just play the game and I think with that understanding and that entrepreneurial spirit is increasing I think and that's, that's probably the single most encouraging thing but we've a ways to go as you would say I have a question here, yeah? Somebody who doesn't like me won't raise her hand. <laughs> <laughs> she looked really agitated when I talked about cultural difference. <laughs> I did not vote for Donald Trump, okay. <laughs> I didn't think these Does that happen here? But you were saying that you don't get the It depends on the institution. British professors don't want to leave the university. Well, the American ones don't do it. Don't leave it either. Although Genentech was filled with academia. Yeah, Bristol Myers is full of former academics. Merck. And particularly what's happening now, the second level down, since postdocs can no longer find jobs in academia, because professors God bless them. <laughs> Stem cells. <laughs> uh, there is a much easier flow on the postdoc level, and in fact, more and more of the postdocs, where we are anyway, are taking entrepreneurship. Interesting. So, a year and a half ago, I hired an Oxford uh, organic chemist PhD. He was a Rhodes Scholar. And uh, he said that telling his professor that he was going to come work for me was challenging. <laughs> and I, he, his professor didn't know me, so I don't think it was me in particular as a concept. <laughs> but those conversations are similar in the U.S. too. Sean. Sure. <laughs> and suggest that um, there's a lot of people who are very I've heard that. The contention is that nice, the, the, this, um, the sort of anti, am I understanding the anti-pharmaceutical biotech bent that nice may have, I don't want to pay for this, I don't want to pay for this, trickles down? Yeah. Is that kind of what I'm sensing? Okay.
So, I mean, subsequently, it's transpired to set the yeah. And frankly, we could be on the cusp of a significant cultural change in the U.S. This is one of the dangers right now. If, if, if those of you that follow U.S. politics, this issue of drug pricing um, has always been an issue that, 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 has, that has ebbed and flowed. But it's, it's, it's called a sort of in cycles. But the, the peak right now, we're at a peak of volume that I have, in my 16 years, never experienced before. I don't know where that's going to end. Yeah. All I can tell you is wh whether it's causative or or uh, correlated or uh, uh, um, the the tweet. I don't know if you know about the famous Hillary Clinton tweet on drug pricing in October, marked uh, for many of us when we look back, marked the uh, the turn of valuations in biotech and some degree pharma. Um, now, we all know that a tweet doesn't change drug prices and that Hillary, once, if and when she becomes president, can't single-handedly do it without a cooperative Congress. That's a whole other issue. But it has elevated, the, it has elevated drug pricing in the U.S. to a level that I've never seen before. And the... the, the young. Yes, the... Yes, that's yes. I, I, I remember Hillary Care, yeah. Exactly. Same thing. So, okay, so we don't have anybody from, from NICE or the NHS here to, to, to defend that case. Um, and I'm sure the, if, there was somebody, on, <laughs> if there was somebody here, they would sort of say that they were basically the custodians of the NHS budget and making sure that they were getting good value for outcomes, which I'm sure that pharmaceutical companies would want to make sure they're producing drugs that were, you know, perfect, uh, providing great clinical outcomes. Uh, the HMOs and insurance companies in the United States do exactly the same thing NICE does. So you can complain about NICE, but in fact, if you go to an HMO or uh, an insurance company that, that says, this is the formulary, this is what we'll pay for, okay, that's the same thing as what NICE does, which is to say cost benefit is... The wire so, price is twice the price of So, so, so th this, this affects pharma companies more than it affects biotech companies. <coughs> What we're trying to do is we're trying to actually sort of, you know, biotech companies would love to have drugs that they could then actually try and sell to the NHS or, or to, to, to HMOs, etc. But they're, they're, they're unfortunately not many of them get to that place. But what I was actually trying to understand was, is there, with European, when European companies come over to the States, what do they have to, do they have to be even better than U.S. companies no. to, to get your attention? No. I mean, so I'll let Mark talk. But no, Matthew, you, you start. No, 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 but I'm saying I'll let, I'll let him go next. Um, but, you know, I think for most U.S. investors or, you know, investors with, with large capital pools, it's the data that drives your decision. It's really not about the company, you know, and, unless, unless there's a bad actor in the management team that, that is well known or something like that. It's about the quality of the data and the market opportunity relative to the valuation of the company. And no one really cares where they came from, right? They're, so that's the, fir that's the first sort of piece. The second piece is... Unless they're French. <laughs> this, 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 is Antoine still in the room? That's a joke. This <laughs> is being recorded. I can't say Donald Trump in that the same. Sorry. So what I was going to say is that the second piece is those, those other things that we talked about, right? Is it liquid? Can I get in and out? Yeah. How long do I have to be involved in it? Right? I mean, an important thing is, right, there are different kinds of public investors, too, right? You've got the hedge fund whose time horizon might be two months for a position, but they are very sophisticated and they will drill down on everything down to, you know, the exact kinds of patients you enrolled in your study and whether or not you screwed up what kind of patients you're enrolling to, you know, a much broader, you know, investor who might be long only and have a multi-year time horizon um, but in the end, you know, and what they care about in terms of their ability to get in and out of a stock might be slightly different. But in the end, they both are deciding whether or not a drug is going to work because that's how, as a public investor in a biotech company, you make money. Couldn't agree more. I mean, the, uh, liquid, uh, t t to your point, that w I think that our clients, we're not investors. You, you may be, but we're, we're not. We advise investors, but our clients just 
uh, care about all the things he said, and he also, I just want to underscore one thing, liquidity. And I think that's why um, a lot of these companies are listing in the U.S. And by the way, DBV is a great French company. So, 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 one, so one of the issues is that um, here in the UK, and, and it's also true across some of the other European exchanges, the, the people who are actually investing in biotechs tend to be the sort of specialists. Right? They, they don't have any choice but to invest in biotechs. Can you sort of give us some sort of idea of you know, what, the, what sort of the portfolio looks like in, in the States in terms of the generalist who actually could put their money to work anywhere. They could put it into Google or to Shell or uh, in, into biotechs. I mean, how important are the generalists? I mean, they, they are the ones who determine whether the sector as a whole will outperform or underperform. Right. They are not in control of this individual stock. Um, but when the generalists exit, um, even little stocks that you may be bullish on for very specific scientific reasons may have a rough time. Large cap names like Amgen and Pfizer I view as the gateway drugs as we call them in the States. And when they work, like when Biogen discovered the new MS pill, when Gilead cured hepatitis C, when Bristol Myers w figured out a way to turn on the immune system to fight cancer like you fight infections, uh, that way, that that excited people, and they made money uh, while taking some risk, and that was the gateway drug. That was warm beer. Once that goes on for a while, they, they get beer muscles, as we call them in the States, and they look down cap. And they say, well, I did it here, I can do it here. So they move on to the next tier, and then finally into the IPOs. And I think there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of generalist demand for IPOs. And unfortunately, over the last six months, I'd argue that's a lot of what's coming out. Specialists haven't lost a lot of faith, haven't lost faith, but the, the market downturn, I, th I, I believe, is, I don't have proof of this, but it's been driven largely by generalists saying, wait a minute, I actually don't know what I own here, and I can't take this. I think you might, um, guys, correct me if I'm wrong, right, because you're current practitioners, and, and I'm, I'm remembering things from the past, but my impression is, I would say the City of London is home to, at best, 10 so-called expert public investors, and that might be being very um, uh, uh, generous. Certainly, I would, I would say there's probably, there's be, probably 20 be, between, you'd say that are very 20. specialist okay. healthcare investors. Right. In the States, uh, you tell me, guys, um, my call list in my last analyst role was 900 clients, of which about 400 were dedicated um, hedge fund or other uh, similar type investors who did nothing but wake up and think about clinical trial data, just like I did every day. And the remainder were so-called generalists. I say so-called because let's call Fidelity a generalist. Well, the silo within Fidelity that runs the billions that they run within the biotech industry is actually managed by upwards of 20 or 30 people, most of whom are either background in industry or certainly scientifically trained. So even though Fidelity is, quote, generalist, it does everything in the world that moves, of course, as we all know, but they have their own pocket of expertise. Now, so you compare those two things, and I'm talking, you know, that's 2008 data. It's completely different now. So I want to say we've got a bit of wood to chop to catch up. It's, it's a light year, right? And so you can't blame Europe's best selectors or Adaptimune or whoever it may be from saying, I think I want a bit of that and not where I am. Sure. The, the only thing I would add to that is that the, the risk tolerance of the U.S. investor is very different from the risk tolerance of the European investor in general, even the healthcare specialist. Yeah. So um, to come back to a, a, a remark that Mark said really early on about sort of, you know, sort of what's happened uh, you know, recently in, 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 in the sort of biotech space and you know, whether or not it's a bubble or not. I mean, we, we saw, you know, it, it, I mean, for, for the last couple of years, it never been so good in sort of biotech and pharma. The, sort of the way the regulators were looking at the particular states, where the regulators were looking at the drugs, it seemed like everything that went in front of them was going to get passed. 
uh, and we saw what was happening in the capital markets. Was that that hiatus? Was that that massive run-up? Was was that justifiable? Now, parts of it. Parts of it uh, clearly was. I mean, there there were. There's one. When I look back in the last four or five years, whenever the bull market started, um, I think that uh, early on the triggers were s certain things I mentioned earlier, which were tangible, verifiable, unambiguous, dramatic successes. So you had a, you had a group of larger cap, more mature biotech companies that effectively stopped growing, and and the growth investor community are the ones that uh, invest upon excitement, not uh, not upon a. a they don't buy things because they've gone down. They buy things because they get excited about them, and, and there was lots of reasons to be excited. Bristol Myers, uh, Biogen, as I mentioned, with the new MS bill, Gilead, curing hepatitis C, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of reasons to get excited. Um, and, uh, and then you had uh, IPOs, and many of those, uh, and, I, and I was wrong about some of these. Many of those, like uh, David Schenk, Schenken's company, Agios, IPO with no data. I said, well, I don't, I don't do IPOs with no data. You know, but today it's quite successful. The data look very interesting. Bluebird is another example of that. So you had unusual low probability, technically we're taught low probability, um, uh, situations turn out very well and make people boatloads of money. Um, and if you look sort of in aggregate and you ask the question, has R&D productivity improved? Um, that's a really hard question to answer. And Matt and I could probably argue about it. This would be a whole three-day conference. But you know, one metric I look at, which was developed by Jack Scannell, who's a former Bernstein pharma analyst, so he gets credit for the metric. I, I work with him to update the data on a regular basis. But um, you know, one simple way of thinking about it is number, uh, is number of new drugs approved uh, in the US per billion in inflation adjusted R&D dollars spent. And that has plummeted since 1960. I mean, I mean the craft is unbelievable. You almost have to graph it logarithmically just to fit it on a, on a slide. But in the last five or six years, it's turned up. And when it first turned up, I said, this is artifact. Uh, but it's been five years now where this has been going up. So something's happening. So I don't know why that's the case. That's the key question. Why is that happening? And that leads to, is it sustainable or not? And right now, the thesis that R&D productivity is better than it's been, at least in our generation, is still a consensus thesis. Uh, the pricing issue is one that's breaking down. Can we price these drugs? But the R&D productivity is critical. People believe it. There's, and if you want to construct an argument that it's real, you can't construct a cohesive argument that it is indeed real. Uh, only time will tell. You know, my belief is R&D ultimately is cyclical, we'll enter a down period, hopefully the valleys won't be as deep as they once were, et cetera. But uh, I would say it's probably justified. Every person in the industry will tell you it's justified. Every person in the biotech industry tells you it's justified. Um, I'm very curious to see how sustainable this trend line is in terms of new drugs per inflation adjusted R&D dollar spent. I, I could go into more detail, but I'll leave it to the other panelists to speak about that. Yeah, I think, I think the only thing that I would add to that is then, you know, the other thing to remember is that the public market investor um, also thinks about things in a straight line. So they're either all going down or they're all going up, and there's not a lot of in-between. So I would, I would agree with Mark that I think my ultimate view on R&D is it's very cyclical because there's, there's some sort of new technology created. So whether it was antibodies or genome or something, which takes 10 or 20 years to then work its way into actually producing a, you know, bunch of drugs that then can come to market and so you get these big bunches that are then separated by some sort of basic science new discovery. Um, and so ultimately I, I view it as, as cyclical but the, the public markets the way they look at it is we're either on the upturn or we're on the downturn. And so that perception then drives the investor view about whether things are investable or not and sort of that hope and that um, you know, excitement around, around certain, certain stocks. Right. So, so, so the excitement it you, you, you mentioned it, Mark, also that it's the generalists have been uh, generalist investors are you know almost like the engine room for. for oh, society. absolutely, and and we we tend to overlook this. I mean, um, to your point, I agree. There are hundreds of specialist hedge funds, but their capital is is de minimis compared to the capital that exists that's value, that's, that, that is managed by generalists. I mean, there's a generalist of fidelity. You might manage eighty billion dollars, and if she decides to put 3% of her portfolio into biotech, 
That's three hedge funds. Yeah. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these funds. Yeah. So, so this is a question for Tim. Um, so I'd like to answer it. It took two and a half hours this morning. Right? I, I, I was going to try and run a sweepstake. It took two and a half hours of talking about you know, what's wrong with the UK biocides uh, before somebody kind of hinted at British biotech. Mm. Okay. Uh, this, was, this was a biotech company where yeah. everything looked like it was going great and then everything went wrong, uh, based in Oxford. Um, and it took two and a half hours. And there is a kind of a sense or at, that, at that time that nobody was ever going to trust biotech in the UK ever again. And, and I just wondered to what extent does the, does the shadow of British biotech still, is it still cast over the sort of like generalist and, 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 their, and their involvement in the sector? And what can we do to dispel it if that is the case? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's easy to be lazy, right? So it's, uh, if you read Keith Richards' autobiography, but, you know, shadows cast <laughs> along. And if you, if you have something which was so iconic and so uh, uh, seemingly terrible at the time, people have institutional memory and the city still to this day, I think, if you say biotech, there's a bit of a, a facial tick, there's a bit of a, mm. you know, I, I can just carry on doing my job investing in this industry, which, uh, you know, the restaurant industry, I can, I can go to a restaurant, I can see the standard of service, I can eat the food, I can make a decision. At the end of the day, it's economic analysis, right? What's their earnings per share? Now we have a little, little, a, 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 a relatively small group of stocks we can do similar things, right? profitable biotech, and then we have this enormous sort of volcanic tail of loss-making entities, which are stock prices masquerading really as sweepstakes on drug development. And that's very, very hard, and that's why pharmaceutical companies use Monte Carlo analysis to try and price their, uh, to use option prices on their portfolio. Well, the city just thinks life's too short for that sort of stuff, you know? What's the market cap of this industry again? My God, that's, that's Andrew Whitty's options on a good day. So, so I can't be bothered. And how much do these people cost again? They're too expensive. They're all MD, PhDs. They're not cheap. They're not going to work for, want to work for me. I just don't think I'll bother. And then it all comes back. And in the UK press, constantly, I don't know. I think oh, recently, blame the media. Go on. recently, <laughs> recently, <laughs> maybe they're beginning to turn the corner on biotech. And we've had some positive articles. But in a way, it's the only the industry's fault. You know, that all happened when I was in the States. And explaining it to the Americans, are like, my God, what are you guys doing over there? Really? He said what? He said, did he point out that it was just a surrogate marker, not actual death, which is the FDA endpoint, mortality? No, he didn't. How come he's not in jail? You know, so that really did hurt. And I think we're still, and I think it's wrong because there's so many good, responsible companies now that deserve uh, a better press. D2E7. Right. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, are you going gonna to ask a question or are we going to have another yeah, polemic? No, I, I'm going to say something first. Um, so, so, so I think the, the great irony, of course, is that Neil Woodford uh, was a big holder of British Biotech when he was at Perpetual, and he got really stiffed, and yet he's still a big fan of, of, of the biotech space. Sean. Quick one. Uh, next bull market in the US for IPOs. What's your prediction? Currently, mine, etc. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm on the sell side, so I hedge everything, as we call it in the States. But uh, I, I don't know. I think, um, I don't know. I mean, that's the honest answer. I really don't know. I, 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 was, I was encouraged that Editas got done. People that have been doing this longer than me, like 40 or 50 years, say that the real end is when the capital markets totally dry up. So it was encouraging to see Editas get done. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think we need to get through the election. I think we need to see what the new Congress looks like. I think these are major league overhangs. In the end, uh, to, to have a whole sector that outperforms. And one thing, we have one minute left here. I just want to mention, come back to something. The question up there biggest well, selling so drug in the world was UK, D2E7. Right. Don't forget that. It can be done. I'm sorry, we're going to have to, 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 to leave that question because I'm, I'm getting, I'm going to cut my head off. So, um, <laughs> so I think that, yeah, we, we, we're, we're, we're done. Um, so um, I, I think that, you know, 
the conclusion from, from, from the, this panel is, you know, this morning we heard that there's the capital of science. I think there's clearly, there, there's, there's, there's an enthusiasm, you know, even if there are some sort of potential dark clouds, particularly in the states. I think there's probably some quest, question marks of, you know, where the, you know, where the deep pools of capital are. Are they here in Europe or do people need to go to the, to the UK? So I know that they're going to be champions of the UK bioscience sector who are also going to want to kill me at the end. Um, but I think that the, the sort of take home message is actually, you know, look across the Atlantic. Um, I would like to, uh, to thank the panel uh, for, for, for their contributions and for, for, for Matthew and Mark for actually coming across the Atlantic to, to share with us um, their, their thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was fine. Thank you. Uh, what a terrific. Okay. What a terrific group of people. I just wish I could have listened to them a lot longer. Uh, uh, I mean, just absolutely fabulous. Our next group will be led by Mark Thompson. Thank you. Um, Mark will be the convener. Mark is with Sidley Austin, one of the major law firms in the world. And Mark uh, has been, uh, the LMG Life Sciences Guide lists Mark as a life science star for mergers, acquisitions, corporate and commercial work in the life sciences industry. So uh, at this point, I turn it over to uh, Mark Thompson of Sidley. Thank you. No, no, yes. She has to do five after you, go to ten. Quick turnaround. Uh, I think we're ready to get, get rolling again. So this uh, next panel uh, and this fabulous day is going to address a slightly different topic than what we've been sort of talking about before. We've addressed you know, the financial communities, innovators, the capital markets. Uh, we've heard from you know, people across the pond, people from here. We're going to turn this a little bit to talk about what can the government do to help advance biotech here in the UK. We're going to look at not only the UK, but we're going to also look at uh, a little bit of the European perspective as well. So it's going to be a slightly different sort of take on, on what we've had uh, had before. Um, Mallory, my name is Mark Thompson. I'm with, with uh, Sidley Austin. Despite my accent, I'm actually have been over here in the UK for about 15 years. So I'm not from across the pond, or at least not, not anymore. I'm definitely not from Iowa. Um, so, like I said, we have a, have a great panel this afternoon. Let me give a quick introduction of who we have here. Uh, we have Natalie Moll, who's sitting right, right next to me. She's the Secretary General of Europa Bio, um, which is a really interesting trade organization. They've been ranked as the number one trade organization in Brussels a few years ago. They represent the interests of the biotech community generally around Europe, sort of healthcare, agriculture, uh, and industrial uh, sectors. Before that, she's had experience in, well, with the Italian National Biotech Association, Dompe, and a few other uh, places around the industry for, um, I guess, the last 20 years or so. Uh, we also have Richard Seabrook sitting immediately to her left. 
Uh, he is with the Wellcome Trust as the, uh, the leader of the business development team. Obviously, in this group, the Wellcome Trust doesn't really need much of an introduction. Um, he has extensive experience in, in financing and developing life sciences companies uh, around the UK and, and, and Europe. Last but certainly not least, uh, we have Dr. Silla Blee. Uh, he's the uh, MP for Brightmoor and is also a practicing GP. So it's interesting that he will be able to give us a perspective from both uh, the government's view as well as somebody that actually you know, faces clients, faces uh, patients at the cold face, which is, you know, I think, an interesting perspective to have here. So you know, we're bringing together you know, uh, finance, government, um, uh, and you know, actual practitioner uh, with, with, with this panel. Um, so, you know, with that, I think uh, maybe Dr. Lee, if you can start up and, and you know, get some opening remarks and we can uh, start talking about, you know, what the, what the government can do to help lead this industry forward. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, Professor Factor, for inviting me. It, uh, I was in Kuwait, actually, when I received the call. I think it was on Monday uh, this week. I'm very happy to step in. As you can see, I'm... I hope you can see anyway, I'm not Nicola Blackwood. Um, it seems rather appropriate that the person who came second to Nicola Blackwood in the uh, election for the chairmanship of the Science and Technology Committee uh, should step in uh, for her today. Um, my three science degrees um, didn't deliver me the chairmanship of the Science and Technology Select Committee, which I think gives you a pretty clear insight into how Westminster does work or doesn't work. Um, <laughs> as a, <laughs> Um, I, um, when I was coming up to Oxford today, I, I sort of reflected upon my time here. I was at the Patchwork Quilt College across the road, and I remember my tutor, um, a, a story he told me, a um, professor of, of, of anthropology, and he did his doctorate in Liverpool in the early 60s. And uh, when he was there as a student, he was particularly interested in amateur dramatics. He was a bit sort of an enthusiastic fest. And one evening, he was at his amateur dramatic society, and uh, a friend of his from there came over to him, and he said, Jeffrey, 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 I've got this wonderful investment uh, opportunity. And he said, oh, well, tell me more. And he said, well, he said, I found this band. Um, and they're, they're, they're wonderful. You must come and see them. Um, you know, for £50, you can have a 50% management share. So my tutor then went over, saw the said band, and made a judgment call that he didn't think they were up to much, and um, decided not to invest £50 in a 50% share. When I asked him about his investment decision, I said, you know, did you regret it? And he said, well, no, Philip. He said... I'm alive and Brian Epstein's dead. <laughs> now, I, 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 you know, I reflect upon that. So I guess the, the thing is, the point I'm trying to make by that small anecdote is that maybe sometimes academics aren't always the best investors. Um, however, I think that, uh, and I've long thought this, and I've long argued for this at Westminster, that investment in science and technology um, really is hugely important um, both to the health of my patients etc but more broadly and this is one of the reasons I've gone from a profession where I'm broadly liked and respected into one that's perhaps not so um, is, is because I actually want my country to be successful um, I want my country to be sustainable I want it to have a future I want it to have a very bright future. I want the great in its name to actually mean something. Um, and that's why I went into politics. Um, now, the government, I think, has done a pretty good job in relative terms. I mean, it's protecting, it's, it's ring fencing its budgets for this parliament. Uh, you will have heard various um, numbers, I suspect, from George earlier today, a quarter of a billion into, in its uh, uh, biomedical catalyst program into 316 sort of early established companies. I mean, all of these statistics, I think, are good news. Um, but I think we can do more. A place like Oxford has got such a wonderful um, list of, of science achievements of discovery. Um, Mallory actually sent me a few. One of them was the ones you sent me, actually, about penicillin trials. Can I just point out that penicillin was discovered at my medical school in London, Mallory? It might have been an inadvertent discovery. 
but it was discovered at St Mary's. Um, but the development of the trials of the drug was done here. I met the chap who invented MRI. He's still here at Oxford. Um, and the list, you can go on. And I think that uh, it's hugely important um, that the, uh, the government of the day supports the science base for those reasons. Because ultimately, where does value come from? Where does wealth come from? Whenever I ask my constituents, where does money come from? I always get a blank look. Some of them say taxes. Seriously, they say money comes from taxes. I actually think that, I mean, money is just a measure of value that man puts on it. I think value comes from a combination of three things. Human effort, raw materials, um, and intellectual capital. This country became the greatest country on earth in the 18th and 19th century because of a combination of those three things. The raw material was predominantly coal, the uh, human effort was all those people who went down into the ground and dug it out. And the intellectual capital was the, the James Watts, the, the people who invented the machines that took that energy and transformed it into products, which we then exported around the world. Our challenge now is, is that I'm not so sure the human effort is as once as, as it was. It's a controversial statement, but our productivity individually isn't as good. Raw materials, well, if we put to one side fracking, our raw materials are not where they once were because we've used so many of them. So we're left with intellectual capital. We're left with our universities, in essence. Um, and I think we really must do more um, to value that. Now, why don't we? Well, I would ask you to go away. I mean, good scientists want to deal, deal with the evidence, look at the facts, look at the numbers. Check out how many science graduates there are as elected members of parliament. Check out how many science graduates there are in the current cabinet. Also, check out how many science graduates there are in the civil service. I think you'll be pretty depressed. Maybe science graduates are that bit brighter because they know going into politics is a godforsaken task, so therefore they don't do it. But the problem is, is, is that these are the people who sort of carve out the plan, carve out the vision for the country. And I'm not always sure that the science voice is loud enough and that scientific understanding is good enough within government, both within politicians and within civil servants. The other issue where I think this country is somewhat bedeviled with is a sort of short-termism, which I think I, meant, I think I heard mention of in the previous panel. Um, the city um, is an asset, but I sometimes think it also hinders a longer-term perspective. I think the quarterly reports phenomenon is a disgrace. You, can't, you shouldn't have quarterly reports. There should be a longer-term assessment of true value. And I think often... The money in this country sort of is zeros, ones and zeros going across the screen. Um, people have lost touch with the concept of what truly is valuable. And that might explain in part why we ended up in the mess we did in 2007 and 8. And I don't actually think that we've learned the lessons of 2007 and 8 in the way that we should have done. And so there is this sort of short-termism. There is this lack of science understanding, and I suspect the same applies in the city. So how do we address this? What do we do? Well, and I have a vested interest, I declare it up front, I think scientific graduates need to get higher up in government. Um, and, I think the, um, and I think the civil service also has a responsibility to seek out science graduates. And I forgot, actually, the media, how many of the journalists. I mean, how often have the scientists in the room giggled at the MRSA virus headline um, in the papers? It's not a virus. How many times do we have to tell you it's not a virus? But they say these things. And it's, it belies an ignorance so great that, in fact, the whole article should be just dismissed out of hand if they can't get the facts, the simple facts right. What else are they getting wrong? And so I think we have a challenge. Um, it's one of the reasons I stood for the Science and Technology Chairmanship. It was like try to inject um, some scientific understanding. And we have a challenge also with this short-termism. On the way up on the train, I was thinking to myself, is there an analogy I can draw with another industry? Recently, we lost one of the, I think, one of the greatest sort of music artists of our age. Um, and I was quite struck by his will. I don't know if anybody saw the details of David Bowie's will. Um, it was 60, 70 million pounds, something like that. I mean, how could it have been so little? How can someone who's, who, who composed so many records over so many, many years of so many different types and forms have ended up with so little? Well, if you, if you look into it, you will see that for the first part of his career, when he was Ziggy Stardust and everything else, he got royally shafted by his contracts, by his, the details of his contracts, his manager. And this seemed to be a problem across the 70s. Queen were the same. 
They didn't make any money out of Killer Queen. It was only when they got out of their initial contract that they managed to start making money. But interestingly, also, their art then flourished, and they wrote Bohemian Rhapsody and went on. And so I thought to myself, is there something similar here? Is, is, the, is, the, is the record company the university? Is the, is the manager the TTO? Is the artist the scientist? Is there a similar situation where the record company and the manager are perhaps trying to get a piece, a large piece up front and ending up with nothing? And in fact, they should take a smaller piece up front and end up with a larger part of something bigger but having a longer term punt. And I think this is the same situation, I think. It's not a perfect analogy, but I think it's there. Ultimately, what Queen and David Bowie and everyone else did was they got out of their contracts. They actually started to flourish. Invariably, they left the country. You know, there was an equivalent brain drain. And they changed the companies they invested in. They made more money, and they felt better about it, so they flourished themselves. How many scientists are we losing at the moment when MIT charges 5%? and Oxford is charging 50% in equivalent contracts. Ten times different. And it really is quite shocking. And so I suspect um, we have to look at ourselves here in Britain and ask ourselves the question, are we making the mistake, as the manager of the initial manager of David Bowie made, the initial manager of the Bay City Rollers apparently also was similarly like this, not that I think the Bay City Rollers is in any way comparable to David Bowie, but I think ultimately... We've got talented people, they're probably in this room. They're having some very, very good ideas. They're coming up with some wonderful discoveries and inventions. We need to find a way of using government money initially, possibly because of the risk-averse sort of nature of, of private investment, to, to find these people, to, to use seed money, to support them, to, to provide the environment in which they can flourish, and in which they feel that they are going to get a return on their hard, on their effort, on their own ideas. So that in the longer term, not only do my patients benefit from a new discovery of something or other, but actually my country benefits because people stay here, continue to flourish, and we actually commercialise these, these inventions, these discoveries, such that, so that this country remains great, sustainable, tenable for the longer term, so we all need happy, successful, productive lives. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to hearing from the other speakers and for your questions. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Thank you very much for that. Turning pages slightly from the UK in particular to Europe, uh, do you want to sort of give your views on kind of where Europe is and, and what you're seeing in Brussels? Sure, thanks very much, Mark. Um, it's, it's always hard to speak towards the end of a conference because if you speak at the beginning, you actually say what you came to say. And then you sit through the conference and you realize that you're going to change everything you're going to say from the beginning. But um, it's a pleasure to be here and very, very interesting from an industry, biotech industry representative point of view, working at a European level to, to really hear the insights of what's happening in the UK, which I, which I hear a lot also from our biotech association, and the comparison. I'm, I'm really glad that towards the most recent panels we've been saying, can we drop the comparison that? I really don't think it's fair, useful to compare either a country like the UK to the US or even a continent like Europe with 28 countries to one country with one language, with one system, regulatory, etc. So I don't, I don't think, I think there are best practices we can learn from each other. Maybe it's because I've got three nationalities, I don't belong anywhere, that I, I, comparisons don't work for me. But um, I, I think that um, what we heard a lot about this morning was really the, the beginning of the process of developing products uh, and, and certainly needs money and science and the transfer of science. But there's a whole cycle, right? And where does money come from? Money also comes from the product being sold. And so there is a cycle. And, and if the whole cycle is not looked after properly and doesn't have the right incentives, you can throw as much money as you like at the science, but it's not actually going to go anywhere here. It will go wherever the whole cycle is facilitated and, and easy to, to work with. So. Um, I, it's very topical, of course, to have maybe a European on a panel in the UK right now with, with yesterday's announcement and, and the next few weeks of work on Brexit or non-Brexit. I think um, the UK is certainly an outperformer in, in biotech. I mean, it really is a place where uh, our, a lot of our companies are, stay, come to. You heard the investors this morning. Um, not only do you have money and the science, but you also have a lot of the European um, 
bits. So you have the European Medicines Agency that approves products. It's here in London. You have the court um, uh, also here. Uh, a lot of the EIB funding that goes into VCs, and there are other people here from, from the EIB who can speak to this, but also come, comes here. Um, and, and a lot of the research funding, uh, European funding, also comes to the UK. So it's very integrated. In terms of biotech, for me, the UK is very integrated in Europe, and it would be a, re a very big shame to see that change. Um, but, but moving back to the incentives, I was looking a little bit about, at the incentives that happen in the UK, and, and we did a study last year with um, EY, it's a big study, but it's online, um, looking just at incentives. So for, for if you're a biotech company, uh, and actually now investors use this as a guide to where to invest, that wasn't the idea. We actually developed it so that as a country you could go to your government and say, well, my neighbor in Germany you know, has whatever it is that I don't have here and I want something like that. And it was really supposed to be a guide and it started out just looking at European countries and then more recently we added some of the big biotech regions. So yes, the US, but also South Korea, Australia, Brazil. And we looked at what kind of incentives are there for outside here. So we're not just talking the VC money, which is very important, or the science, but really as the company develops, what kind of, is it tax credits, is it patent boxes, what is it, is it cash grants, what kind of tax holidays, because these things all matter right, right now, it's not just the money you throw into it or the scientists. Um, so that's the second bit of that, if, if I look at the life cycle of a company, so you have the money and the science and then the incentives, but, but accompanying all of that you also have a whole regulatory pathway and, and market access. And we, none of us, we haven't talked about that yet. But I mean, um, the US regulatory pathway of market access is quite linear. And it's one language and it's a reimbursement system and it's, you know, it's maybe not so predictable right now with all the elections things coming up. But I mean, it's visible. In Europe you have, yeah, a European approval system which can have or not have hurdles, but then you have market access in 28 different countries with different languages. Uh, if you are a small SME, do you really have somebody who could, who could ever phantom going in all those different countries speaking all those different languages to get the product on the market? No, you're going to have to uh, find another way of developing. So I think that's why the comparison sometimes I find is very unfair towards our, towards our, our, our smaller companies. And I think more can be done in terms of taking the um, best practices, a lot of them from the UK, you know, taking a lot of the best practices we heard about the catapult, we heard about the catalyst. I mean, there are a lot of things happening in the UK that make it a very unique place to do business. And, you know, you have a huge business community. We were, was it 650 people at your dinner last week? <laughs> so that's a huge community of, of, you know, people who are, who are focusing on biotech from the government, from the parliament, the industry, the scientists, and the money side. But it's not, I don't think it's a competition. I think um, uh, we some, I think we talked about Italy this morning as well, and France, and difficulties in, in all these countries, but they all have a vibrant community. They all do things slightly differently. What I find a bit of a shame is that the, that the VC is very, tends to be very local. Probably, again, because of a language situation, because of localization, whatever it is. Our stock exchanges are also, there's Euronext, and there's, there's, then there's the London Stock Exchange, again, quite piecemeal. So um, we, we don't make it easy for ourselves. I don't think. Having said that, I would go again on the positive and, and look at what we can learn in terms of best practices, do a little bit more of, of sharing of that, um, and a little bit more looking at the whole cycle uh, and making sure that we don't forget that the products actually have to reach the market at the end. Uh, I think the new ideas of flexible um, flexible routes for licensing, whether it's adaptive licensing, early access, these are all things that for the biotech industry are fundamental because there isn't that much money, it's a long process, it's risky, it's expensive, and yet we address some of the most unmet, important unmet medical needs. I mean, chronic diseases, whether it's rare diseases, children, I mean, we're, we're addressing things that patients can't really afford to wait for, you know, whoever it is to go through the 28 countries to work out whether the product can reach the market. So I think our regulatory system is becoming more adaptable as much as a regulatory system can become more adaptable. And the whole issue of pricing that was discussed before is a, is, it will be probably a, a stumbling block um, that might determine you know, how, how the industry does in which geography. It will, it will develop wherever it develops, but you know, we have to keep the whole picture in mind. Okay, interesting. So Richard, from 
from your point of view and from the Wellcome Trust point of view, how do you see the government, whether it's mm -hmm. here in, in, in the UK, whether it's you know in Brussels, and let's you know maybe now assuming that there's no Brexit, you know we'll see how that goes over the next several months. Let's assume we, we have the current system today. Mm -hmm. How do you see the government being involved in what, what you're doing? Yeah, <clears throat> so I, I think uh, you know, the UK with a tax-funded uh, healthcare delivery system does, does make us unique. And I think one of the important consequences of that, and I, I think an important differentiator, is that um, the government has to understand health. Um, it, because it has to allocate resources to it. And I think, be, you know, that's all wrapped up with how, with how we manage the healthcare system. Uh, it's also connected to how we see the healthcare system and its adoption of new technologies and new inventions, which is, you know, currently uh, the subject of, of, of a review, the Accelerated Access Review. Uh, but I think it, the, the UK and the Department of Health, in many respects, have actually been, been ahead of the curve compared to other healthcare systems. So, I mean, I, I was fortunate to go to the States in 2014 to a joint NIH-FDA meeting on antimicrobial resistance. And the Department of Health strategy, which it announced in 2013, was seen as the, the template strategy for dealing with... Uh, drug resistance and antimicrobial resistance. Um, we've had some US pharmaceutical companies that are very, con you know, concentrate their R&D effort very much in the US. They're coming over to the UK because they really want to understand uh, what this thing called genome England is. Um, you know, it, it is potentially a transformational way of doing medicine. And the UK, the UK is leading on that. Fortunately for, for the Wellcome Trust, that, that organization is going to be located on the um, Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute campus. And we know that it's already acting as a, as a catalyst for SMEs and for entrepreneurs who are all interested in the computational problems of sequencing and interpreting uh, genomes uh, and large, uh, at a large scale. So, you know, g government initiatives, because they have to understand health, um, I think is benefiting our, our innovation and our system. Um, you know, we, we've, we've, we've alluded to various funding schemes. Uh, you know, the UK government has got various funding schemes to stimulate um, the entrepreneurial and SMEs. Uh, you know, compared to when the Trust started translational funding 10 years ago, it is, it, it is dramatically different. There is an awful lot more early stage funding available. Um, the uh, US, the scale of this in the US is, is just enormous compared to the UK. I mean, everything is 10 times greater in, in, in the US. But nonetheless, we are still able to develop you know, first-in-class technologies. We've, we've heard about uh, Humira, which originated from the UK. It is the world's top-selling drug. I actually think there's quite a, a long gap as to um, where our next top-selling drugs are that, that, that are UK biotech originated compared to the US. I think if there's one area where government could help us, I think is around, um, around the, amb the ambition uh, of, of our companies. And I think it's probably the same in Europe. You know, we've got this very nice um, cycle where you know, you know, some academics come up with some great IP. At, at some point, that gets spun out into an SME. The venture capitalists come in. You know, the venture capital funds are largely funded by industry. So you know, to some extent, they're an extension of the same pharmaceutical medical device med tech network. Uh, they co-invest with the corporate venture funds. Um, and, and it's a very nice relationship. Uh, and we, we lack the ambition to actually go beyond that phase two human proof of concept study, which gives a very nice exit to the investors, gives a very nice exit to the management team. And what we don't do is retain the overall economic activity of having a company that's grown to have a sales force. 
And that's what they've really succeeded in doing in the States. And I think maybe they've done this in, in Switzerland and, and Scandinavia. Uh, so I, I think we need to be more ambitious. Um, and our, our top three pharmaceutical companies in the UK, I think they've been the same top three. They were the same top three 10 years ago and probably you know, 15, 20 years ago. Whereas in the US, you know, we've got J&J &J and Pfizer, but number three is Gilead. It started off as a biotech company. Number three used to be Amgen. These entrepreneurial companies are giving the big companies a real run for, for, for being the mega cap companies. And we're, we're not producing those in the UK or in Europe. So you think that one of the fundamental problems is that at the phase two level, they, they sell out? Is it because they need the capital markets in the US or they just go to big pharma or what's I, the... I, I, I suspect there's a multitude of reasons for this. But I think one, one way to, to look at this is that we, you know, the management teams and the investors that invest in those companies, you know, they're programmed to exit. You know, they need, they need their exit. They need to recycle their funding. And we, we need a, some sort of asset class that allows those early stage investors and those management teams to get their reward without having to sell out to a bigger company. So we need some sort of funding uh, asset class that allows companies to go from that phase two to actually building a fully integrated manufacturing company and retain the economic activity in the country that's undertaken all of the risk. It was interesting to hear you talk about ambition at, at that level. One of the things I think we've heard earlier today was ambition at, at even the sort of earlier stage. We talk about, and there's been a lot of conversation about how the government has pushed innovation once it's sort of in a company, talked about how you can streamline um, approvals of drugs. But, uh, and I asked, I guess initially, uh, Dr. Lee, to you, do you think that government should have a role, and if so, what could it be, in helping foster a entrepreneurial spirit at you know a place like like Oxford, where we could work to convince the the professors and the researchers to take their research that's sitting on the shelf right now that may cure you know all manner of disease and, and, and commercialize that? Where I get concerned maybe is that first step. Maybe, maybe lacking, people may be resisting that. Is, is that one of your concerns? Is that a government concern? This is all about where the incentives sit in the, the process, as I see it. Um, and I mean, I, another hat I wear is I'm on the Parliamentary Space Committee and successfully lobbied for an investment in a company um, that was developing something called the Sabre Engine, which is like the sort of successor to the jet engine. It's all British technology. Um, and I said, look, you know, you've got to put some money in to get this to progress on further. It's at its very early stage. They've patented the technology. Um, and the government did put in about £60 million into this to take it on to the next stage. There is a difficulty, one would count, particularly with the Conservative Party and the right of politics, is that we don't like picking winners. Using government, having an industrial strategy, putting money into private companies, we're sort of we're a bit uncomfortable about it. And I think, actually, that that's all very well, sort of, um, it's because it's sort of a post-Thatcherism thing, that we sort of don't do that. But the problem is the world does. The rest of the world does do that. Yeah. And so what they do is they're coming along and they're picking off. So what's happening with reaction engines and their Sabre engine, as I understand it, is most of the people who are interested in buying it are American. It's American investors are kind of coming along. And wouldn't it be great if that engine was developed here, produced here, and replaced all of the jet engines and what have you. And so the problem, as I see it, is that there's a deep reluctance to try to pick winners in government as a whole. Where I think the government's been quite good is the catapult phenomenon, there's one at Harwell with regards to space, is that that does create a sense of, right, we all they sort of coalesce around it, and it allows the smaller companies and the ideas to come through and the inventions to come through. And I think that idea is a sort of almost like a halfway house from those who want sort of full-on industrial strategy in choosing sectors, and those on probably mainly in my party who say, no, just let the market take, take its, wherever the move goes, fine. The problem with letting market forces run all of it is, as I said in my speech, is the short-termism that tends to prevail in the system. And most of what we're talking about here, it takes a long time to go from having a hunch to putting forward a theory, then, then testing the theory, and then getting the results and the evidence 
and then coming forward with something. This is, can take years, sometimes decades. And if you're sitting there with your pension fund, maybe not pension fund, maybe just more of a short-term investment, where are you going to place your money? Where are you going to place your capital? So I actually think the government's role maybe not is in not choosing the particular piece of science. It may be in actually looking at the city and the way in which the city works, and the way in which investment works in this country still, underwritten, unfortunately, by the state in 2008. I'd love to see the balance sheet for financial investments, in view of the fact of how much was nationalised, and the younger you are, the more screwed you've been, um, over that period of time, in order to, to support an industry mm. which is, by definition, quite short-term in its perspective. So I think the government's role is probably looking more at that and trying to find out a way of, of making the city uh, take a longer-term view on investments and on where value can be returned. Tough, do you, though. Do you think that there is a, or does government make a distinction between short-termism that you get with respect to, like Sarah, last panel where you had public listed company analysts yeah. and the venture capital community the private equity community from, you probably didn't hear the couple of panels before yeah. that, where the venture capital guys will say they take, now that they may be sort of brutal on the way yeah. in, but they will take a, you know, two, three, five, seven year yeah. investment They're horizon. Better. Yeah. I mean, the venture capitalists, by definition, tend to be, have a longer term view because they take, tend to make riskier, this is, I mean, I'm not an expert, but they tend mm. to make riskier investments. So therefore, I, my judgment would be that they would take a longer term view. But is that really where all the money is? I'm looking to others who know more about it. I suspect the significant sums are in pension funds and the like that tend to be more risk averse in their investments. Yeah. And they tend to invest in retail outlets. Yeah. Now, Bracknell's getting a new retail um, development hold of it. Come to Bracknell, by the way, in about three years' time, come shopping. <laughs> the investors leave in general. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a pension fund. Yeah. And, and so, you know, is that money better off putting into retail? to increase the consumption that most of us can't afford? Or should that investment be going with you guys? That's the problem as I see it. There's a sort of almost a cultural sort of, mm, yeah, that biotech's a bit risky. Mm -hmm. So Richard, mm -hmm. does the Wellcome Trust help bridge that gap a little bit? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're largely an early stage funder mm -hmm. um, because we, you know, we're a scientific organization. We know and understand the science and we stay close to the we stay close to the science. Clearly, as part of our portfolio, portfolio there is Syncona, uh, which is a patient investor. Um, and they've, they've got some great investments which they're nurturing and building. And the ambition is that they will become uh, you, you know, fully fledged companies at some point. Uh, but you know, one, one organization can only do so much. We need, we need a critical mass of um, investors that, that, are, that are looking to build you know, durable, sustainable companies rather than exiting when the returns, you know, when the financial parameters are right. Is there anything that the Wellcome Trust is particularly lobbying government to do to, to help in that regard, or is it more of a free market? You know, we, 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 we contribute to reviews, government, requests for um, opinions, etc., etc. So, so we do it that way. It's, it's not really the trust's role to, to lobby government, but we certainly talk to government uh, and um, you know, respond to their, to their requests for opinions. So Natalie, from a, from a European perspective, uh, are you all actively lobbying governments, talking with various, whether it's, whether it's at, the, at the Brussels level or at member states levels, about what they can do to help innovation and, uh, and grow the biotech industry? I at, hope at the, so. The, well, I know, but at the lower <laughs> levels as opposed yeah. to the, the big company level? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, I mean, that's, that's the biggest part of our job, obviously, is to make sure that, that the, the industry is sustainable. I was just thinking of, of who else can help compensate the, the money after maybe the, the first stage, and I think Looking at the European level, certainly the European Investment Bank has, has made, and maybe through lobbying or anyway through, through suggestions or also of ours, has created new instruments that work for biotech companies. They didn't use to. They used to have risk sharing finance facilities that meant that the companies had to have money straight away, which, which typically a biotech company doesn't have for the first 10, 15 years. But they now have. They have, you know, they have funds for mid caps up to 25 million. They have thematic uh, funds up to 75 million, but it can also be a, as small as a 15 million project. So 
that there are new instruments now. It's not easy. We had a meeting with the bank uh, two weeks ago in Luxembourg. It's not easy for such a big institution. Their job is not to go around advertising that they have. It. I mean, they have it, but you know, they're they're a bank essentially. They're not a VC. So um, the the difficulty is bridging this whole new development in the bank with companies all over Europe. And again, you have the problem: 28 countries, small companies, smaller companies. Mm -hmm. Some speak English, some don't speak English. It's, it's not as simple as as the equation in the U.S., which is which is one country, one uh, one language. But I think that there have, there have been developments both on the framework funding, so for research that used to be pure research and now it's more moving towards innovation. So the Horizon 2020 funding makes more sense, and there are more SMEs applying because it's an easier process. Things get done faster. Um, so that that's moved a little bit here, and then the EIB funding is, is kind of moving here. So. But you know, for now, EIB is funding big companies like UCB and Sanofi. So still not, still not reaching out to the ones that we want to grow, to the bigger companies that the US has managed to do. But I, th I think there are ways. Um, again, essentially, I think in addition to all of that, you really need to look at the whole. So the government, yes, can help fund, but they also, all the governments, you know, wh wherever they are, including the, uh, the European level, need to have that whole life cycle of the product all the way to market um, access functioning because if it doesn't it's just too attractive to do it somewhere else so we can I mean in Europe we are the research hub of the world we're fabulous you know we throw all this money at research and then and then well look I mean the news this morning one of my member companies and, and the Chinese yeah coming up so I mean <laughs> it's a bit of so obviously Syngenta um, has products in the European market but what I'm trying to say is that we need to look squeaky clean and shiny and and, and that that kind of slide all the way to market access needs to be very functional in order for the companies to, to stay, for the cap venture capitalists to feel comfortable that something is going to come out at the end of the slide over here. Just, just I mean, in terms of what government can do, I mean, I sometimes think government tries to do too much. Okay, so it tries to have its fingers in lots of pies, with the, with the best of intentions. So, for example, we spend over a billion pound a month on international development funding. I sometimes think, well, why don't we just put all of that money in? We know that there are going to be pandemics. We know this. We know there's a drug resistance problem. We know with an increasing population and with globalization and the movement of people and flights, I've just I've been in Kuwait two days ago. We know we've got this problem. So why don't we spend 13 billion pounds a year in this country on investigating Zika virus, Ebola, antibiotic resistance and the like? Because I bet you that that would be to give a greater return to the world and would help those populations that with the best intentions we seek to help with various projects. I mean, apparently there was some money spent on finding the Ethiopian equivalent of the Spice Girls as part of international development funding. I'm sure it was an admirable project to back. The, problem, the point is, is that when you end up spending all these money on all these different projects, first of all, international development funding gets ridiculed because, some of it, because there is fraud in the process. Why don't we just say, right, okay, Britain is going to give this to the world um, when it, because we know these pandemics are going to become increasingly problematic for us to deal with. It's just an idea, but I just think the problem is, is that we, we don't look at it like this. I think there's an absence. Of, I remember saying to a sort of a seasoned wise out Westminster, I said, are there any strategic thinkers in Westminster? Because I haven't met any yet. <laughs> And he looked at me and said, don't be stupid. <laughs> and I think, you know, jokes apart, we have the money. I just don't think we spend it well. Uh, I think I was just going to say, <clears throat> as we heard this morning from the venture capitalists, at the end of the day, <clears throat> they run, except for Sincona, seven to ten year funds. <clears throat> Which means they're, and, and because they have to come up with exits, <laughs> They have to yeah. get their companies out. Yeah. Now, if the only way to get them out is to sell them on to pharmaceutical companies, that's yeah. what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why. So if there are no institutional investors who are willing to back these companies in a portfolio fashion in the UK public markets, you will not have yeah. uh, native biotech yeah. companies in the UK who are full-fledged companies. And that's, that's the funding gap. Mm -hmm. They gave us a debt-based instrument. Uh, if you look at the 
biomedical patents fund are probably the biggest influence over the last, sort of, I don't know, 10 years on the growing UK life science companies. That funding's now been cut. We're talking a lot of good ideas here, but in terms of the actual actions that help these small companies, they're in a very difficult part of their evolution, their life, their life cycle. Uh, it seems that, you know, although the government is shouting, no one's really hearing. Uh, I understand that everyone wants to prioritise this. And, you know, biomedical capitalists is fantastic. But the reduction in funding there has been crippling for the sector. And in lieu of what we talked about earlier and the, and the, uh, the over-dispersed nature of funding in the UK, for the average company, it's, it's, it's a problem. I, I'm not a member of the government. So I'm not here to represent the government. Um, let's put that on record. Um, I, I think, again, it comes back to understanding of the sector and of the industry. Um, and, if, and also there's an element of the electoral cycle coming into play here. You're going to put your money in. Are you going to get a return in five years in terms of return on employment? You know, the sort of figures, the sort of things that appear on pledge cards at, at elections. And that's part of the problem as well. I mean, politics, I think we are all, I mean, I think actually politicians are increasingly, haven't yet adjusted to the sort of Twitter 24-hour social media age. So you end up with reactive government, not proactive government. You end up with governments worrying about tomorrow, not next year or 10 years from now. And I think to a certain extent that also drives the investment sort of, I mean, I, I was in Kuwait and somebody said that there was a story on Twitter about production of oil out of Saudi and the barrel price went down $5. There was a story on Twitter. And this Kuwaiti rang up a series of contacts in Saudi saying, is this true, is this true? It turned out to be nonsense. But upon this, investment decisions are made in the price of a barrel of oil, which has an impact on all of us. And so I think there is a problem at the moment of us adjusting to this immediate world where we immediately communicate. I say something now that's disloyal to the government, bang, it's on Twitter, and I'm getting a phone call from the WIPS office. It is a nonsense. And I don't know how you deal with it except through understanding and leadership, actually. Well, one of the questions that just raised, if, if we've, we've heard a couple of times today that there may be uh, cutting money going to the biotech sector for startups. Richard, for, from, from your point of view, whether it's a personal point of view or from the Welcome Trust point of view, is if there's less money from government, is there, pri is there enough private sector money, be they from funds or big pharma, that are filling this gap? Is there a shortage of capital at the early stage? There's, there's never enough money. <laughs> um, I, I think on, on balance, you know, when we started out with translational funding in, in 2003, it, it's dramatic. The world is dramatically different today. There is, there is funding available f um, through the research councils, through Innovate UK, it, you know, the, the biomedical catalyst might be going through a bit of a, a dip right now. Uh, you know, it, it, it's difficult to keep the science base going and to fund translation. You know, this is all about how, how do you allocate the resources available, uh, and they're trying to do a balancing act. Uh, so I, I, I think that good peop, people with good ideas will get funded. Yeah, just quickly, I, I keep coming up with things, I keep thinking of things. Second, the first thing with regards to Brexit, um, I don't know where it's going to go, but the European Space Agency exists outside of the European Union. Okay, the funding of the European Space Agency is separate. We leave the European Union, we don't leave the European Space Agency. Oh, yeah, I wasn't and listening. so there is a model there for European understanding uh, around technology and advancement. I just think it would be a shame for you. I, 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 I'm not you. saying whether it would or not. I'm just saying there is a model there to copy if that were to happen. I don't think biotech investment and progress is going to feature much in the election in the referendum. Here. That's the problem. No, no, People I won't don't, talk if, about if, it. No, 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 but no, if, it were, if it was to happen, then we, we, we do have a model. Um, and I can't remember what I was going to just say a second because I'll come back. Come back to me. It's an educational piece that he's doing as well, because obviously there's some big success with the government's Dunning funding, the, the NHR and all the money's gone into that, the recruiting over 600,000 participants into trials in the last year. But do the, the wider government know enough about the benefits of being research active and the benefits of taking part in research? Do the public know, and, and do the, 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 the general funders, you know, the public funding areas, they know enough about research? What can we do about mm -hmm. raising money? 
the level of understanding of the benefits of a research uh, rich economy. Yeah, thank you. You've actually prompted my what I was going to say, which was around hospitals. Uh, Richard, you mentioned about hospitals. I, mm. we, we need, I would argue we need to get to a point where we have fewer hospitals, big hospitals in this country, away from this digital general hospital model that we sort of had post-war, and creating these big regional centres. Some parts of the country, Adambrooks is, is one in Cambridge, some of them are developing. If we were to do that, you would have this large population, three quarters of a million, a million patients, using this hospital for various reasons. You would then be able to have a research base attached to those. So you can't have a research base attached to the local sort of DGH because there just isn't money, there isn't enough patients coming through to, to warrant it. If you were to do that, you could have this research base. And I've said, when I, in answer to your question, when I, was, I did a sort of a tour of public meetings, I talked about the potential of the Thames Valley having a regional hub hospital and that it would then also attract research investment, pharmaceutical companies or whatever, to it. And it was very interesting, the public hadn't thought about it. The public didn't realise that, I don't think the public really know where drugs come from or, or research, how that can benefit their um, knee replacement or the treatment of their rheumatological disorder or whatever it is. Um, and I think if we were to go down that path, which in, we have to do, we have to do this with our hospitals, um, there is an opportunity for people like Welcome Women to get involved in that process and to be able to support research establishments attached to those hospitals. And then I think the public, because they can see the link you see, it would be on the same side. And then they think the public would then understand the value of research to the broader economy. Um, so, uh, I don't know, um, uh, I just want to make a comment. So, this is about bridging biocides. And a lot of what we talked about today has been very much focused on drug and early biotech. The industry is a lot broader than that. Mm. So, the industry is drug and biotech, it's medtech and devices, it's services, and it, that's a lot broader. What we talked about today is To what extent, so, is that service sector resilient in terms of a, um, a further um, development of the Chinese economy moving away from manufacturing to services? Uh, I think it's very resilient. It's based on, personally, it's based on real know-how, reputation, and has a bunch of and, and these people are providing services not just to the those companies, but to international companies. Mm -hmm.
I think those are, that, those are fantastic points. I think that my takeaway from what we've heard here and in the last few panels is while some people sort of hang their heads and compare what we've got here to the U.S., it should not be a hang your head type issue. It should be, yes, there are certain advantages to the larger marketplace there, but we've actually got something really good over here. Services in particular is, is, is one thing that I think that this country probably leads the way in, you know, I at least in, in, in Europe and probably globally when you think of sort of service providing sectors, my sector included. Um, it, it, is, it is kind of a remarkable remarkable thing. But I do think that where a lot of this gap comes into play is when you have such long developing periods for pharmaceutical products, bringing them from, you know, the laboratories, you know, all around this town to the pharmacies. And the question I think is how can we make the returns to the investors faster? How can we get the um, the, the, the professors sitting here to say, you know, actually, I actually want to go and, and develop that as opposed to just writing my paper. I want that Porsche, right, what, whatever that is, to, to, to get them to do And I know that's a hard bridge uh, to cross. Is, do you see, uh, Dr. Lee, do you see, do you see government trying to do anything to address at that level, trying to change the perception of, you know, just having a job as being a professor to saying actually go out and do something more, do something more for your, you know, whether it's for your wallet, for your country, for some way to exploit what they're doing? Look, I don't know whether government is going to do anything, but what would I do? I would make all universities independent of the state. I would make all universities, I would, I would, perhaps if you were selling the banks, here's an idea, we're going to sell the banks back to the market, why don't we use that as seed money for universities? Um, then let universities develop, make their university attractive to particular professors to come along, and part of the package is they get to keep a larger percentage of, the, of their work. So you make actually being an academic a more attractive proposition. I mean, at the moment, most physics and maths graduates from this university, what are they going in to do? They're not, they're, they're, most of them are going in to be into the city, aren't they? They've been taken in offered huge amounts. They're not going on to being maths and physics teachers or, or something else. They're being attracted by the financial returns and drawing up complicated computer models which end up actually hiding the fact that they're losing money. It, that's my... That's my <laughs> Um, amateur assessment of it, but 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 I but I um, you've got to make it more attractive. Now I think government's role. I'm 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 reluctant as a Tory to be too active in, in, in government role, but I think actually universities themselves. I think if they were given independence, given a sort of a bequest from the state, off you go. I think they would do a better job as independent entities of then changing the way in which they then employed their academics so that they made them more of an attractive proposition so that they did their academic work but they also had this commercial return potential. So 
So I know we, we've got to wrap up. I'm getting the uh, time uh, sign. Any final comments? Just um, thank you. I found this really informative. Um, I turn on a positive note. The, the minister you've heard from, um, he's one of those rare examples of a round peg in a round hole at uh, Westminster. He's very passionate about life sciences and has a track record himself, as I understand it, prior to going into politics of being in the venture capital area investing in life sciences. Um, so I'm really pleased that he's in the role and one can only hope that he will then have bring influence to bear because of his actual prior to politics experience in the sector that he will, will bring about what I think we all want in this room, which is a successful um, bioscience industry in Great Britain. Thank you, but I've got a dash to a train, so thank you very much. Thanks for stepping in. You are a hearty bunch. Go grab a cup of coffee, be back here in 25 minutes sharp. We have an hour and a half after that, and then libation, alcoholic libation. I just want to Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. How are you? <laughs> yeah, good, good. Yeah. So, so I wasn't, when I thought about what I was going to say, I had planned on, on, on saying, you know, the, the funding, the late stage funding. Right. But that's it. It's, it's, it's it. And then it just pulls everything from you. Can't get anywhere if you don't have that. Yeah. Certainly not if you want to build companies. Well, not if you want to be sustainable. We're always going to be working too hard to, to get the
Jeremy's in, it's been the
there's three, you know, like that, there's three topics. Um, well, uh, yeah, if people want to stand up there, that's fine. Just, I mean, just pop that in your pocket um, and uh, you can either clip it on your belt or pop it in your pocket. Oh, um, so in my pocket, thanks. I'll go and mute them all up. I think they may be muted. Are you doing, are you on this one? Yes, yes. Five heavy nine, Andrew. Hi, David Ray. Yes, me. Yes, Andrew. Yes, yes. So you're a flagship? Yes, yes. No. I've, uh, we haven't had too many interactions, I don't think. With, uh, Very few, I think. So yeah. If you were going to ask me for extra batteries, I was going to tell you. But... <laughs> well, you're all on two bars. I'm hoping that's going to last. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> um, if it does It's a small room. Um, and I'm on. You've got that? Yeah, I don't turn them off. Anymore. Right, Just, I don't need them all up there. What I was going to say. Some of my colleagues, Keith Blundy, Larry Storenka, and what we need yeah, now. Yeah. Right. Mm. Just sent this.
two bars left after three, so we reckon just about on those, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs>
stand for. Okay, tonight we got to get seated. Um, Ms. Nelson, could you please come up here? We need you. We need you. Okay, the faster you all get seated, the faster we can get out to the alcoholic beverages. So please, please, please. Okay. I mean, this is the... This is the session I have been anxiously waiting to hear. Can we settle down, please? Can we get you to settle down, please? Please? Shh. Thank you. Um, I, I, I need a drink. And you, are, and you are causing me to have to wait longer, so stop it. This is the session that I've been waiting to hear. This is the session that I think will um, kind of put this whole day together. And the convener of this session is a gentleman I called up um, at the last minute also because um, today was a day when all sorts of earnings were being done with GlaxoSmithKline and Merck, and I said, I need you to come and... Uh, convene this session. And um, he said he would be happy to return where he took his first class degree in chemistry in 1974. That's right. <laughs> and so here he is. And just so you know, he spent four years in the swamps of Washington, D.C. Um, as an editor. He returned to London in 1981 as technology correspondent of the Times. Then he moved to the BBC as science correspondent. And he joins the Financial Times as technology editor in 87. And he's been the science editor of FT since 1991. Um, if you heard some of the speakers saying that we need people in the media who understand science, this guy does. And we are just thrilled to have him convene this session. Clive Cookson, thank you so much for being here. It's all yours. Thanks, Mallory. Well, I understand science. I'm not sure I understand finance, even though I work for the Financial Times. We'll see. Um, as you said, I worked down the road at the old Dyson Perrins lab for four years, and it was great as a break from whipping up my molten sodium flasks in the fume covers to try and bring about an organic reaction called the acyloin condensation. It was great as a break to come here and commune with all the bones and the dinosaurs. This is one of my favorite places, so it's marvelous to be back for this for this conference. Um, now, tech transfer, as Mallory said, this is really, and as the program says, a crucial piece of the puzzle. Every university, every government lab, every funding organization these days has some sort of tech transfer office to bring the fruits of research out of the lab and apply them to the, to the outside world. And the, the motivation isn't or shouldn't be just to make money. Certainly for biomedicine, I think for research more generally, there's also some sort of moral or social duty to translate it, if it's biomedicine, into the clinic and medical practice. And um, of course, to work well, tech transfer labs need good contacts, both among the research staff in their institutions and in the outside world of finance and industry. They have to work within defined legal and regulatory constraints, but they do have discretion about the terms they negotiate, and I'm sure we'll get into that a lot later. They mustn't be too demanding in the financial returns they require for their IP, but they've got to make enough to make the exercise worthwhile, and that balance is obviously critical, and we'll, we'll be talking a, a lot about that. This afternoon, we're going to hear from one of the world's great practitioners of academic tech transfer, Lita Nelson, who's run the MIT Tech Transfer Licensing Organization for exactly the same length of time I've been science editor of the FT, 
i.e. since 1992. No, I've, I, I've been running it since 92, but I've been there since yes. 86, and March 6th will be my 30th anniversary. Well, I've been at the FT almost since 1986, but I've been running the science in 1992, so we do have a lot in common. <laughs> Um, you've got the biogs of the um, speakers in your programs. I won't run through them all. So after um, Lita, but also from the US, we're going to hear next from David Berry, who's just flown in to Heathrow on an overnight flight. But as you can see and as you'll hear, he's very, very perky. He's a general. <laughs> <laughs> you are, David. We have to be <laughs> used to He's um, a general partner with flagship, flagship ventures which is one of the most active commercializers of university research right across the board of science. And representing the UK, I'm delighted to welcome Andrew Waldron, who's head of legal and, head of legal and company secretary at Cancer Research Technology, which is the tech transfer arm of Cancer Research UK. We're going to follow the usual format, 10 minutes or so talking from each speaker, brief and lively chat between the three of us, and then an even livelier one when you all get involved. So, please, um, would you like to start? You can you speak want me to. from... Thank you. Actually, you, you might be wired up. See if that, see if, start speaking, Lita. And see Am I okay? Yeah. yeah, okay, don't need it, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I have learned a great deal this today, and as Natalie said, you come prepared with remarks and then you sit through the talk and you change completely what you were going to say. So, I'm an engineer and I'm seeing differences between the UK and the, and the US and have for, since I've been involved with the UK, tech transfer one way or the other since 2000. Um, but when I see differences, I look to say why. And let's get into the one about terms. Why does MIT have this 5% of equity and Oxford has 50%? It's kind of simple to do, to analyze. It starts with money. The UK university tech transfer offices are seen primarily as financial engines. They don't know that tech transfer is not a predictably profitable business. In fact, it's predictably unprofitable. In the United States, it's a mature industry. By Act was 1980. The statistics of 200 reporting in research university and institutions um, in 2012 brought in a total of almost $3 billion. That sounds like a lot. It wasn't. If you divide it by the research base, it's about 4%. Take out the inventor's share, whatever, it's about 3% of the research base. That's the good news. The bad news is that little bit amount of money was completely skewed. Less than a dozen, dozen universities accounted for 50% of it. And if you go back to 2009 and run the same statistics, which I did, the total was a little less, it was nine universities, and it wasn't the same nine. Almost everyone, everyone in the top 10 had one blockbuster patent that when it expired, the tech transfer director went from a hero to a bum. So it's basically, if you want it to make money, you've got the wrong idea. It's a lottery. It should be being done for all the other purposes of products to the patient, local economic development, entrepreneurship education, and experience for students and fulfilling both the let me see my research real and financial uh, ambitions of the faculty. 
which in turn allows you to attract better faculty and enormous difference in the type of students that you attract. Okay, so let, we in my office are expected to have impact. Income is a nice thing to have along the way, but it's primarily impact. So it's how much are you doing and how well are the things you're doing doing? So it's impact, not income. Most UK tech transfer offices are expected <coughs> to derive income and they have to derive income because they are so starved for money that in order to file next year's patents, they have to bring in a lot of money from the few licensees they have. So if I were in their shoes, what would I do? I would try to do it by asking a lot up front. The second thing I'll say that in some ways more justifies what the UK universities are taking, this will shock you, MIT doesn't start companies. Our faculty and students start companies. On day one, the founders own 100% of the company. Then they come to us and we just give them a license agreement on reasonable financial terms. We're not asking half the company to take a, when a company takes a license from a third party. Now, of course, when David comes along and takes the other, takes half of the company to finance it, then the, the founders only have a half. Of course, if they started with a half and he came along, they'd have a quarter, but that's another story. Uh, so, one of the things that justifies how much the UK tech transfer offices do is that they start the companies. They start with 100% of the company owned by the university. And the university's put a lot into starting that company. Proof of concept funds, to the extent they do anything, writing the business plan, coaching people, even hiring the executives. So they are acting like it's their company, and because of their policy, they share some stuff with the inventors who are not really the founders. So the issue is, do you want that to continue or will you support your tech transfer offices sufficiently that they can do their work and grow without big upfronts? Will you teach the chancellors, vice chancellors here, uh, that it's not likely to make a lot of money, so the tech transfer office won't be feeling oppressed all the time. And then maybe, if you do enough of it and the terms are reasonable, you'll have more guys like this flocking around and you can let them do the hard work with the professors to form the company. <laughs> Great provocative stuff. Thank you, Lisa. Um, David, follow that. Sure. Uh, <laughs> well, first, uh, I will say thanks for the opportunity to be here today, and uh, thanks, Mallory, for uh, making sure I was here today. Um, I, I've learned that I have two obligations in the next 10 or so minutes. One is to be perky, and the other is to talk about uh, how to be on the, on the other side, if you will, of the table of uh, of, of these innovations that are coming out of universities. Um, so let me, let me start by giving a, a little bit of a perspective of where I come from, uh, because the model that we follow at Flagship is a bit different than what people tend to think about when they think of that uh, somewhat ugly word, venture capital. I say somewhat because, well, we think it's very ugly, uh, but then people get confused as to why we would be called a venture capital firm. But that's a longer story for over drinks. Um, but so we, we do three separate things within Flagship, all under one, uh, one collective roof, if you will. One is we do the classic venture investment where, in this case, there is an entrepreneur or more typically an academic who has a, an idea, an innovation, in many cases, but not all cases, 
a patent or patent application and we'll basically work with them and invest in that idea and help them build the company. That's about 20% of what we do. About 40% of what we do is working with, say, a leading academic who doesn't even have data, but has an insight that something's gonna go into, an, into a direction. And basically work with them to build a much bigger story than even they were thinking about, and extracting out of that almost an essence of what one might be able to build. Now, again, these play off also academic licenses and things along those lines, but in these cases, there usually is no IP at the time that we're engaging. And then the third thing that we do is we invent our own technologies and start companies from scratch. And this is quite atypical in the venture world, which is why we don't really like the, 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 the word venture. Um, but we have a team literally of 20 or so dedicated folks who, through a very systematic approach, look at white space, come up with new ideas, and we build companies that we fund solely. So in this case, we almost play the exact counterpoint uh, of, of academia in that we own 100% of it at the beginning, but there are no founders. It's basically the process that, that is the founding. But when we ultimately build these companies, you wouldn't know uh, where things come from. But having the three elements of what we do gives us a pretty interesting perspective. Because from the portion where we found our own companies, now we have about 170 odd issued patents at flagship, about 1,000 or so that have been filed over the last 15 or so years, um, which of course pales in comparisons to places like MIT, but I think if you took every other venture firm in the US combined, they, it's probably more than that, but that's, that's a different story. Um, what we find is the vast majority of the patents that are filed in the early days of these companies are things that the company never pursues. Now it's not to say that they're valueless because they put a stake in the ground, they put a, a line in the sand, if you will, and they establish a foundation off which a lot of thinking was derivatized. And it's ultimately those downstream patents that become substantially more valuable. Now why do I say that? Well, when you think about the relationship that the company has with an academic founder, what's really being formed is this allegiance and this desire to collaborate. And there's a recognition that I think goes in, in some universities it's mutual, in some universities it's not, that that founding intellectual property is a foundation. It's not the entirety of the beast. And I think that's be that becomes something that gets built in, if you will, to the, the ethos of the company as it gets going, which is if you think that what you have is the asset which you licensed, your company will become no more and no less than that asset. If you think, on the other hand, that what you have is the spark of the beginning of an idea that can be substantially larger, then what you will become is something that could be substantially larger. And I think one of the things as we look across the landscape as, if you will, consumers of academic IP, there's universities like MIT that, that understand that in some cases you have bread and butter IP that's very important. In some cases you're representing at the beginning and they're very good at working with, and I'm not just saying that because Lita's here, um, but they're very good at working with companies as they grow in making sure that the portfolios mature mutually so that it can support the longer term vision. And when that longer term vision is successful, then both sides benefit much more substantially. Then you have a set of universities who don't quite see it that way. And they have hard and fast, they have hard and fast rules. So for example, um, I guess I can name names. Stanford has a, a hard and fast rule that for all companies where they give an exclusive license, they require 10% equity in the company. That's a tricky prospect. On some cases, you can stare at the IP and convince yourself that it might be worthwhile. But in some, if you look at the amount of investment that's going to go in, it's a much harder thing to get yourself comfortable with. And where this gets even worse is when you have institutions that just missed out on something. Um, and I could give a quick example, but not to say that this is happening to them per se. When you look at what happened around this company, Juno, uh, there were two major licenses that was taken. One was from uh, Fred Hutch and one was from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Fred Hutch uh, is, is rumored, I don't have hard data on this, to have made up to about $600 million off that license. And Sloan Kettering was rumored to have made up to have made up to 100 million. Now, I don't know that those numbers are right. Right. I, Possible. But the, but the ratios were where the difference, where, where is, where is what the, is what's important. Because 
you, when you see universities feel like they didn't do as well as they should have, then they try to figure out how to make it up on the next deal. And that creates a bigger, a bigger dynamic where you start seeing universities almost start to overreach into each and every deal, and it has an anti-innovation effect. It stops the universities from collaborating as broadly. Because I think as, as we start looking, looking at working with various universities, we're, again, we're looking at it not as a single transaction, but as a lifelong partnership where we're seeking to, uh, where we're seeking to build something that's, that's great, where we're seeking to collaborate with the academic founder to do something that's a step further than they thought about. And as Lita mentioned, there is a financial piece of it. You know, we do invest. We, we do invest in a way that we think that there's going to be the ability to to gain. Of course, we have our own uh, limited partners who uh, are expecting returns from us. But at the same time, especially because we see that this is an ecosystem, it is important from our standpoint that all the members of the ecosystem are successful. The more successful all the members of, of the ecosystem, the more successful the ecosystem. The more there's going to be the next company. The more there's going to be the next innovation. That doesn't just work for venture capital firms with portfolios. It works with universities, and it works with even the individual academics. And I think it's that longer view, and that view of how we're going to create long-lasting value. I think that's what becomes very important when one thinks about how to how structuring licenses and thinking about building companies becomes more successful. So thank you. Thank you for the fascinating substance and the gossip as well. So, Andrew, as I said, the UK view. Thank you. Well, I can't promise any gossip, but if I begin by giving you a bit of context from the UK perspective, I think in a way the role of the organisation that I work for, Cancer Research Technology, is complementary to the, the kind of activity you'd find in MIT and sits in an intermediary position to the sort of situation that Flagship Ventures will find itself in. Um, I find myself here today substituting for CRT's chief executive, who I think in turn was substituting for another initially invited speaker, so any errors, omissions, or lack of preparation on my part is entirely um, down to me. As Clive has said, Cancer Research Technology is the wholly owned subsidiary of Cancer Research UK, who may be familiar to you as the largest funder of cancer research in the UK as a charity. It's also the leading independent funder of cancer research around the world. My organisation, CRT, also has a relationship with some other cancer charities, so it doesn't work exclusively on behalf of Cancer Research UK, and it also works with a number of European oncology-focused not-for-profit research institutes as well. But to give you some kind of feel for the scale of that activity, so Cancer Research UK this year will fund about £400 million worth of research in UK universities and institutions. CRT itself doesn't quite have the authority and status of, of MIT's technology licensing office, but it's been around for a long time, so it's mature by UK standards. It's been operating since 1982, so not long after the, the Bayh-Dole Act in the US. Uh, in the current year, we'll turn over about £65 million. That's derived for, principally from royalty revenues from four drugs that are on the market. Two of those are blockbuster drugs, and the real benefit from that for CRT and Cancer Research UK is less the cash that comes in, which is reinvested in cancer research, it's the patient benefit that that represents, the societal benefits that we seek to achieve through that, um, which is critically important for sufferers from very aggressive forms of brain cancer, for example, in relation to one of our drugs and prostate cancer in relation to, to another. The scale of the organisation, we've got about 120 employees. Now, that's about 45 people working in an office environment, doing the kind of things that I do and my business development colleagues undertake, principally in London, but also spread around sites in the UK, where Cancer Research UK has a big presence in terms of research funding. We've also got a small footprint in the US, in Boston, Massachusetts, where we have a subsidiary organisation, which is out there trying to market to biotech and pharma in the US opportunities to well, buy into to UK cancer research. Um, but most of my colleagues actually undertake small molecule drug discovery research at laboratories in, in London and Cambridge. And that's something that Cancer Research UK is active in doing in a number of other places. So it tries to create a drug discovery infrastructure in the UK, which is perceived as meeting a need in terms of translational research that historically has not been met, even though the, the current investment climate may be improving or it may be perhaps about to stop improving depending on how one takes the, the earlier discussions today. 
One thing I should also mention is in 2012, as a joint venture with European Investment Fund, CRT formed a project investment fund as a venture capital vehicle, a limited partnership venture capital vehicle, which in the past 12 months has grown to £70 million in size in total. The, the purpose of that is less to invest in companies, but to invest in projects to try and take them from lead optimization, so far as therapeutic molecules are concerned, into the clinic and as far as phase one or phase two A studies. Might just reflect a, a little bit on my own perspective in terms of differences between the US and the UK technology transfer or technology licensing um, sectors. It's certainly the case that the perception that the US sector is much more mature is true when you look at the likes of, of MIT and the other major universities. I think there has been some increase in maturity within the Golden Triangle, within the Russell Group universities. Um, ISIS innovation, obviously, in Oxford should not go unmentioned um, in that regard. I think there's also another factor in US academia, which is the greater diversity of universities, which leads into a greater diversity of practice when it comes to technology licensing, I think. So you've got independently funded research institutes. You've got those which are much more reliant on federal funding. In the UK, the situation tends to be more homogeneous so far as the funding is concerned. Um, I mean, there's also, I think, opportunities to work across the sector in the UK which are perhaps more evolved. So I would say that from Cancer Research Technology perspective, we work with a large number of UK universities and we take Cancer Research UK funded IP from those universities. But the Apollo Therapeutics Fund, which was recently launched as a joint venture between University College London, Imperial Innovations and Cambridge Innovation Capital, is perhaps another example of that. There's also what's perceived to be the much greater entrepreneurial spirit you'll find in um, US academia. Perhaps that's beginning to change in the UK under pressure from things like the Research Excellence Framework, which is looking to pick up on a point that um, Lita was making on impact measures that are broader than uh, simply publications and, and citations. But there's still a big gap there. And there's been a lot said today about the venture funding environment, so I, I won't say very much about that, other than just to observe that things may have improved in the UK, but there's still a significant well, lack of funding, um, which I think Richard Seabrook referred to in the previous uh, session. So there are similarities, fundamental similarities, I think, between the US and the UK, one of which is the legal landscape. The Bayh-Dole Act is, I think, widely seen as having revolutionized the situation in the US so far as allowing technology licensing to operate in the way that it currently does. The UK also has the same situation. It also allows universities to own their intellectual property and to work through their tech transfer offices to, to commercialize that. But I think the US and the UK also face a current challenge, which is a downturn in federal funding in the US, of about 5%, I think, in 2014. In the UK, as was mentioned previously, there's a real term, well, there's a, there's a real term reduction in funding uh, a, effectively, we're freezing uh, research funding in UK universities for science at the current level that it is. Uh, so that does represent a challenge. I'll just briefly say a couple of things about developments, I think, which come out of reports from the UK government, which might have an impact on the technology transfer sector in the UK. The first of which was Damon Dowling's report into university and industrial collaborations. Now, that did make the critique of university tech transfer offices that they are focused on the short-term observations that have been made here. And it did recommend that university tech transfer offices look to the longer term, both economically and also in terms of broader, broader societal benefits, which they can seek to achieve through research out of universities. It was also critical of the complexity of putting in place legal arrangements in the IP landscape in the, the UK, and also did remark on a lack of alignment between the expectations of companies and universities if they're trying to collaborate together. The other report I just briefly mentioned is the Nurse Review on Research Council funding, which came out towards the end of last year with the proposal that the, the current research councils are brought under the umbrella of a new organization, Research UK, which I think Paul Nurse described in his, an immortal phrase as one body with seven brains. Um, may be seen how that will play out, but it will provide an opportunity for funding across the remits of existing funding uh, organisations. Also probably worth keeping an eye on the fact that Innovate UK is now um, under the umbrella of Research UK, or that's proposed, and it's going to be 
transitioning to a model by which it's actually making funding available through convertible loans of some kind or loan funding of some sort. So that could have an impact on the life sciences sector and certainly for, for young companies. Um, I think I'd be taking advantage if I went on any further at this point, Clive. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Okay, so I don't want to go too much into the complexities of um, tech transfer, but if you have a university, an academic group in a university, that they'll have normally some funding out organizations outside the university, which might be someone like Cancer Research UK or NIH. It might be a big company, it might be GE or um, someone like that. Perhaps, Lita, you can talk about how you work with all the sort of okay. other people who think they might have a stake in that okay. technology. And I might then ask the other two how it applies to them. Well, first of all, if we try, pray, whatever, that commercial funding grants be kept separate in Professor X's lab from his NIH and whatever lab. On the whole, NIH is basically, we can do what we want with the IP. We can start a company. When we work with commercial entities, General Motors, um, it's very straightforward, and you'll all be shocked. We own the IP under no circumstances. So you think we're easy to deal with. Uh, uh, under no circumstances will we assign the IP, which means that we are continuously negotiating, particularly outside the biotech area. Inside the biotech area, by now, most of the pharmaceutical companies have figured out that we own the IP. They, if they pay for patent costs, they will get a free, as will everyone else, a free non-exclusive license, which basically gives them freedom of action. And if they want exclusivity, they have to negotiate for a royalty bearing. Why is this important? Primarily, it's important because we want our technology developed. If uh, with licenses, particularly exclusive licenses, we can insist that use it or lose it. If, if a company is just going to take it and sit on it, leave it free so that our co people can form companies. This is the most important aspect of it, and one that we can't make exceptions because you make one, you make, you can never hold the line. The, and we get there. In fact, right now, MIT has almost $120 million a year from large corporation sponsors. So eventually you get there if you, if you, can show that you can make it work for them. With charities, it becomes a lot more complicated. Some of them understand the issue. Some of them want to so overly control the issues, this is the disease foundations, that they assure what they want to happen won't happen. And that is, for example, they say, you can start a company, David can fund it. But if after three years, we don't think they've had made enough progress, we can take the license back, which thereby assures the people as smart as David won't fund the company. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, it's not funny in a way. So we have a, a campaign going on to the major, well, a little skunk group of universities you've never heard of. MIT, uh, Stanford, Yale, University of California have formed a little skunk group to try to talk these people into, look, we start lots of companies, we get them funded, we'll push forward your technology. If the company is no longer using it, we'll take it back, but stay out of it. 
uh, and we're beginning to make progress. <laughs> Do you recognize any of this, David, what Lita's been saying? Very much so. <laughs> um, and I'd, I'd say from one who sits on both sides of, of the table on various parts of this, um, it's a, it, on some sides it's a blessing and on some sides it's not. Uh, and what I mean by that is when a professor is working on something new and we have an interest in it, the great thing that we know is there's no question as to whether MIT is going to have the rights to be able to license it. And that is that simplifies the ability to do the analysis that one would do and invest the time and, and effort around diligence that you need to do in order to make an investment. At, in other universities, you can go well down a path and then they'll tell you, oh, by the way, you can't have an exclusive because it turns out so-and-so already has a non-exclusive or an exclusive in this field. And that's a problem. Uh, that creates challenges not only for that, but also for the future, because then you start wondering, well, do I actually want to engage in diligence before I know what rights I can actually have? On the other, on the other side of it, when our companies do want to support, uh, support work and fund something in a lab, you also know that you can't get the IP rights. And it changes a little bit of the tenor of how one might want to engage. And it, again, it's good to know what you're getting into before you get into it. I think that's the most important part. There are certain cases where we'd love to be able to figure out a way to do something that's, that's more collaborative. Uh, and I think in those cases, there may be the opportunity to get some uh, net value by doing some funded research that could become something from an IP perspective that doesn't because the company has too much of an import of controlling the IP. Um, but you, know, you can't put a value on things that you don't know what it is. And I think it's more important to know exactly what you're getting than, than presuming. Andrew? You don't behave like these American <laughs> disease foundations, do you? Well, I'm about to embarrass myself, Clive, by admitting that, in fact, Cancer Research UK is an atypical organisation by reference to most other medical research charities in the UK, that there's guidance from the umbrella body, the Association of Medical Research Charities, which tells universities and research charities that they should tend to leave ownership of the intellectual property with the universities, there are some outlying charities. Cancer Research UK is one. The Wellcome Trust, through its tech transfer division for strategic and translational awards, is another, where the expectation is that CRT, through assignment or exclusive licensing, will have rights to take forward the commercial exploitation, and that then we will deal with the likes of flagship ventures and, and others in the UK, biotech, pharmaceutical, venture capitalists, to further develop that. You know, we would have no trouble with that, with an exclusive license because you know what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, seriously, you, you have a track record and it says that you can get it out there. You might even be able to get it out there better than we can because you know your market better than we will. Okay, now I think we've got another 20 minutes or so, 15 or 20 minutes. Who would like to, Mike, shout? <laughs> You mentioned uh, the, the, the Beidou uh, Act, and I just wondered yeah, how, how influential or how impactful has that piece been for the sort of tech transfer successes in the US? And is this something that you know, other places should try and... Uh, the the Beidou Act is very simple. It really does much less than people think it does which is useful. All it does is say, if you have a government grant, the university owns the IP. There are other, it doesn't keep us, if we wanted to, from assigning the patent to General Motors if they funded it and the government didn't. So it, it, that's not why we have that policy. Um, I think your policies are close enough that I don't think it makes it's much different. There's, the only other two rules is we can't assign the patents. The government has to be given a non-exclusive license for government purposes, but that's irrelevant except for military procurement, essentially. And what's interesting for the legislators here, if there are any, there is a margin right that the government, in theory, could take it back if the company weren't making enough progress. But in 36 years, they have never shot that gun because it's a gun too big to fire. Uh, 
it, it would be subject to political pressure, uh, or it would ask people like David to trust a government committee that they judge whether it was okay. So, We're very trusting in government. Oh, I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> has, has the reform of the US patent law and the whole row over patent trolls, how much has that affected things? If that goes much further, we might as well go out of business. Between the uh, Patent Reform Act, which allows anybody to challenge a patent at any time without standing and is already causing chaos in the biotech industry, the Supreme Court uh, ruling that almost everything is a fact of nature and unpatentable except compounds so that the diagnostics industry is in complete disarray in terms of patentability. And if the next round goes through, which threatens to so, in the name of preventing patent trolls, but mostly in the name of the large IT companies saying, we don't like these little guys suing us, uh, that make the penalties for infringement so minor that it is much, it will be much cheaper to infringe a patent than to take a license. The, the, govern, the U.S. government is dismantling what has been so successful. David, are you as dismayed as Lita by what's going on? I'll say in, in a simple way of looking at it, it's scary. Um, there was a period after the Supreme Court ruling where if you spoke to an average patent attorney um, about how to think about strategies in biotech, they would tell you it's not clear until the patent office starts to opine what, if anything, is actually issuable, including compositions of matter, because on the theoretical possibility that that molecule or that protein could have been found in one instance in nature anywhere, then it might not be patentable. Now, good news is we've gotten through that. But that was a period of about six months, which just put a, a, uh, almost a mindset of chaos into how, how people would be thinking about, about patents. And we see it from the same perspective, which is that if you want to invest the time and the money that it takes to be able to make a drug, you need some form of protection. If your protection is going to be constantly called into question, then you're going to, you're going to have a whole set of, of, of challenges in developing it. I will say, the one caveat that's coming out of this is, and we'll, we'll have to see how the FDA and other regulatory bodies um, react to it, is there's a whole set of therapeutic classes that are emerging that have a complexity to them that make them a bit more susceptible to know-how and not having to be as openly disclosed in, in patents. And some of these, for example, include the emergent field around microbiome therapeutics where um, there's a mixture of bacteria, uh, more importantly than the mixture and the names of bacteria because the people who have named bacteria uh, are dealing with science that's a couple of decades before where the actual details of the science are, i.e. they named them by strains as opposed, to the, um, as opposed to the actual DNA sequences and the changes that occur from manufacturing. You can keep a lot of, a lot of the uh, proprietariness through know-how. Now that's an exception today. But the shift that will happen if we can't have things that are protected is that becomes the rule. On one hand, you can develop ethical therapeutics. On another hand, that smells like the, the pharma industry that we knew back when people brought around carts and gave you their, uh, their random elixir of the day. <laughs> well, and the IPR thing for the biotech, what happens here now is that anyone can challenge your patent. And what's happening in the biotech industry is a big company will see a patent that may be dangerous to them later. They will challenge the patent. The expense of defending the patent at a time when you would never have sued the person, so you, because you haven't got a product or whatever, uh, is starting to be of such major things that the chairman of Bio called me, and he's really on the case. He called me because they've identified it as such a major problem. And we had an IPR not in 
not in biotech, but it was one where we were suing the people. They ch instead of meeting us in court, they challenged via an IPR. They brought a piece of prior art which had been brought to, at, to the patent office by us. And the patent office overturned the patent anyway. Wow. It was an absolute shock. The, the, <laughs> the whole push is towards uh, weakening patents. Don't yes. ask me why. Are you feeling that, Andrew? Well, I mean, although I operate within the UK, clearly the market, particularly for cancer therapeutics, depends on an intellectual property model that is international, and particularly economically, it depends on the US patent system. So, so indirectly, we're affected by inter-parties reviews before the US Patent and Trademark Office. One of the drugs that we get income from at the moment is subject to, to an IPR. I, I probably feel a bit more ambivalent when it comes to the Prometheus decision of the US Supreme Court. It has had a chilling effect in relation to, to some kind of investment thinking in the US in the sense that it, it, it meant that some of the very expensive genetic testing kits that were out there, which Cancer Research UK felt was you know, an egregious use of intellectual property, then it's removed that challenge. I won't mention a certain company in Salt yeah. Lake City. Right. But, um, <laughs> But the law of unintended consequences has yes. taken over. Gentlemen there, you, and then there. So, Lisa, you painted a very simple <coughs> and very clear modus operandi. And clearly, you've been immensely successful. In if you were doing your job in the UK, would you do anything different? From what we're doing now? Well, I first tried to convince the upper administration that it wasn't about the money. And then I would try to convince somebody, in, in the case of the UK, probably the government, which would be impossible in the US, to provide enough support for patenting that the, we have to find ways, but you have tech transfer support in the UK. You just have to focus it right and take the emphasis off, you know, instant sustain financial st sustainability that you see in almost every grant that the UK gives. Now, I don't think I could do it my way here, which means because I'd be an employee doing not what my boss expected. <laughs> Yes, sir. So, slightly counterintuitive between the uh, discussion about IP just now and the Prometheus decision. Over the last five years, the royalty monetization market in the US. The which? The royalty monetization market in the US has really matured. So, right. they're, now, they're now pricing single digit on returns, which is very tight. Has that changed the way that any of you behave, I guess, especially from, a, from a, a, an MIT and a, a COUK perspective? That only works if you have a drug on the market. We don't have any. It's nice if you could monetize a royalty stream. It makes, it doesn't necessarily make sense in non-pharmaceuticals for a university that thinks in decades, because we're gonna need the money later as much as we need it now. But in pharmaceuticals, where the risk is very high that it falls out of bed, you know, it's binary. You're either earning millions and millions or you're earning nothing. Speak to Merck one day. Uh, you are offlaying your risk in monetizing your royalty stream. And, and Royalty Pharma and those big guys have compiled a large enough portfolio and done the statistics very well that the discount they have to take for the risk is not punitive. So the whole thing makes sense. I wish I had one. Andrew? Well, I suppose CRT has had experience of partial sale of a revenue stream from a drug on the market. Um, 
the reason that we did that is we had a particular investment that we wanted to make in creating a drug discovery laboratory. Um, it, it was only a partial sale, so we tried to retain some upside in relation to it. But it's, I, I think for anyone who's got an asset that you can monetize in that way, it's certainly an attractive option to have. And some of the discount rates that are available now are far more attractive than the ones that, that I was being presented with back in the mid 2000s. So it's, it's, it's a good thing. Long may it remain that way. Yes, gentleman in brown there. technology transfer options there, because uh, I've got the lots of books which is just up the road. But um, just to appreciate what the drive is for a technology transfer mid-tier thing is that the way that we recruit undergraduate students at San City is by the Sunday time ranking of the university. And the way students pick their, their university is literally, apart from the top five, is where do they sit in that ranking? And part of that ranking is influenced by the amount of research group, the Research Excellence Framework Program. And therefore, we absolutely need to find income to actually push us up that ranking. We do not get large grants, we just don't have that capacity. And therefore, the income that we get from technology transfer is essential, not just maybe if, but it's essential for us to improve our research so we get up our rank and therefore get up to the Sunday Times uh, uh, ranking. And if we don't have that, we just slip down it, and you just have a look at what well, part of it is. we can make a consistent income from tech transfer that uh, we not we, we just, uh, we generate, uh, it's, we've grown, we're the top 10 uh, income earners right. in the UK. We have the highest, biggest uh, consultancy units. Of course we take well, consultancy is a different story. No, but, we, you know, but I'm just saying the incomes, are very, not just important, they're essential to all mid tier universities. That's what's happened to Coventry and Hertfordshire. They've just shot up through the ranks. Yes, I think, I think that's true. I mean, I was wondering in that context whether the great squeeze on American state universities, the public universities, which I know, the, I think there's only one out of the top 10 US universities in these league tables, that's um, a state university, and that's Berkeley. They're suffering some of the same squeeze. Is, is that showing up in, in what they do? It may show up in other things they do, but they don't know how, none of us know how to make money consistently from technology licensing. Okay. Uh, mostly what's happening is the universities are madly scrambling to get more support, research support from industry. And they're devising, there's a race to the bottom in terms of what they will give away to companies in order to uh, bring in the money. And so far, we haven't had to do that. Well, have you found anything, David? No, the one thing I'd, uh, that I'd, I'd add on that is when you look in the US, you can see hubs like Boston, hubs like San Francisco, where there is a truly mature ecosystem. And in those cases, I mean, in those, in those places, you see a volume of transactions that's substantially higher than just about anywhere else in the world. And you could look at other major cities, um, even, even cities that have great schools in them, like New York, where the ecosystem around biotech in particular is highly immature. And as a result, the challenge in doing tech transfer, I think, is, is magnified. So I think one of the things that becomes very important in this is establishing the right ecosystem, because with an ecosystem around that includes the entrepreneurs, that includes an ability to create entrepreneurs, that includes an ability to fund the entrepreneurs, all of that comes together to support a higher transaction rate. And I think that starts to solve some of the problems that one gets at. Of course, that's not an overnight solution. And that doesn't, I'm sorry to say, translate much into income in terms of licensing. It's interesting that... It does for you, but it doesn't for us. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that it's so regionalized in the U.S., the sort of this, well, start, these ecosystems. You know, people say, ask me, does MIT, have, for years and years have asked, does MIT have an incubator? And the answer I say is, yes, it's called the city of Cambridge. Yes. It's, it's an infrastructure that has grown up over more than half a century. <clears throat> Yes. In terms of 
role models so you know how to get a company started, venture capital, lawyers and real estate people who know how to deal with fly-by-night, maybe they'll be Google and maybe they'll be dead companies, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the scarcest resource anywhere, which is CEOs who know how to run and grow and manage companies towards results. When you have an infrastructure, you grow your own. You're, you know, the head of El Nylum was number three in Millennium mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. You, uh, you, ha you are growing your CEOs in the com small companies you've already formed. Mallory's making some single digit signs to me, which I think means there might be time. Does anyone want to make a, yes, sir, a last killer question or point? Um, I just wanted to follow up Catherine's road. Um, we talked a lot about some sort of process and licensing and infrastructure, and um, actually digging out the interesting opportunities, and then as you described it, sort of curating the, the teams and the companies themselves, and um, it requires a certain sort of social skill set as well. And I just wonder whether the panel have any views about whether there is a substantial difference or an identifiable difference between the way that people are handled in the UK tech transfer environment versus the US. That's good to end with a people question. Who would like to tackle that? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, it's, I don't even think it's a U.S. versus U.K. question. I think when you look from a people and a process, from a people and a process standpoint, I mean, it, it varies very systematically across the board. Um, I could point within uh, Cambridge to two institutions where the process is exceptionally different, where the ethos is exceptionally different, and the ability to get things done is exceptionally different. So I think the, the culture becomes a very important part in how the process uh, actually gets, gets manifest. And I could also turn it on to the other side of the table from, from where we sit. Uh, we also see that as the different institutions have a different culture and a different mindset and a different set of priorities, there's frankly a different way that you engage and you negotiate. Because in certain cases, there are certain things that are negotiable and certain things that aren't. Um, unfortunately, there isn't hard and fast rule of US, UK, or uh, one school or another, it's, it's really on an institution uh, or office by office basis. Yes. Andrew, do you? Well, I think it's, it's a really interesting question. I'm, I'm not sure I disagree with anything that, that David has said. I, I'm not sure there is a, a, a UK phenotype and a, a US phenotype that you could easily distinguish on the, the axis that you're trying to explore. I, I will say one thing about culture and staff. Um, I'll say the obvious. Business is a different vocabulary and a different language from academia. And we have hired mostly people who, with good technical, very good technical backgrounds. They don't have to have PhDs, they just have to be very smart. Uh, and who have had 15 or more years in industry in non bench positions. They all take salary cuts, but that's, uh, so they're bilingual between academia and industry. Uh, and I think that helps because they have some idea of how industry makes decisions. And related to that, the more your faculty consult, not in the British sense of inside the university laboratories, but the American sense, which is go out and work a day a week or something in, in companies, yes. the more you then have that bilingual ability to some extent in the academics themselves. Thank you. That's going to be the last word, Lisa. Thanks so much to you, to Andrew, and to David. I've loved it. And back to you, Mallory. Wow, thank you so much. We are getting toward the end. Alcoholic beverages will come soon. A uh, couple of quick thank yous. A quick thank you to, again, to Ellie Price over here from OB. Without her, uh, half of you wouldn't have been, in, uh, I'm sorry, none of you would have been invited. And um, uh, this would have been a much more difficult event to have done. Also, Julia Parker, who's probably not around, uh, she's with the museum. The museum has just been fantastic, wonderful, terrific. 
um, to work with. Uh, the reception is going to be downstairs. Please enjoy this place. It is wonderful. Um, from his hospital bed um, uh, on Sunday evening, Sir David Cooks, he said, there's one person you have to have, um, and if you can get him, you are very lucky. Um, he um, comes, he was educated here at, at Balliol. He spent most of his career as a journalist with the Financial Times, joining it in 1958 and serving at its ed as its editor from 1991 to 1990. Um, he then joined the London School of Economics and was appointed a senior fellow in LSE's Department of Management. But the reason we absolutely need him right now to speak is he has a book coming out called, uh, it's a book on biotech called Science, the State, and the City, Britain's Struggle to, su to Succeed in Biotechnology, which he's, writing jo which he's written jointly with Michael Hopkins. It'll be published by Oxford University Press in two months. Sir Jeffrey Owen, thank you so much on short notice for coming to talk to us. Times. Um, he took a degree in chemistry. Uh, I took one in classics, so I'm totally unqualified to talk about um, to talk about biotech or, or biotech or pharma. However, together with my colleague, I spent the last most of the last couple of years trying to answer the question: Why hasn't the UK biosec biotech sector done better? Or, putting it slightly more broadly. Why has it been so difficult for European countries, not just the UK and Japan for that matter, to keep pace with the US or to catch up or narrow the gap with the US in this sector? Now, two themes that we explore in the book are, one, was the sector or has the sector been let down by the financial system? And this has come up in one or two of the earlier sessions. Is there a problem of short-termism? Uh, that um, makes it difficult for uh, biotech firms to access funds and so on. And the other question, which is the one I'm going to talk briefly about just now, is has the government, have successive governments in Britain in some sense let the biotech sector down or provided inadequate support? And that is this one of the reasons why the um, sector hasn't done as well as it should? I I've been interested for it interested for a long time in the more general question of what governments can do to promote new industries. And there's a long debate among economists and, and policymakers about whether governments should concentrate on what are sometimes called horizontal policies, that's to say trying to encourage innovation across the economy as a whole without selecting particular sectors and vertical policies in which sectors which are thought to be of special um, importance uh, deserve are given special support. And that kind of, um, how that balance has worked out or, uh, in, in the last, um, since, since the biotech sector got started in this country is, is, is something I'm going to talk about in a second. Now, to go back into history, not so long ago, but um, reasonably long ago, <coughs> If you go back to the late 70s, a Labour government in power worried about declining competitiveness, especially in science-based or high-technology industries. Biotech, people saw what was happening in the United States, Genentech getting founded, uh, Amgen, Biogen, and so on. Fear that the that the UK was losing ground or, 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 or lagging behind and other countries were, were uh, taking the sector seriously. So under the Labour government, a committee was set up to try and see whether what steps should be taken to um, uh, enable the UK to perform more strongly. 
And this led to what was known as the Spinks Report, lots of scientists and policymakers involved, one outcome of which was the creation of CELTIC, the creation of CELTIC in 1980 with government funds. The private sector was involved, but the government, through the National Enterprise Board, was a substantial shareholder in CELTIC. This decision was taken by the Thatcher government, which had entered office in 1979. And in many ways, a rather surprising decision from a government and a prime minister who disliked the notion of government intervention in, in industry. It was a kind of unusual act by, by the, the conservative government to do that, justified on the grounds that it should help to kickstart the biotech sector and promote or encourage more collaboration between academic scientists and, and, um, uh, and industry and business. Now, whether CELTEC was a good idea, whether CELTEC was a good way of starting the, uh, of, of kick-starting the sector is much debated. Some people think that it was a mistake to have given CELTEC exclusive access to discoveries coming out of the um, uh, Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. Might, some of these things might have been exploited faster if it had been licensed more, more widely. CELTIC in its early years was not a great success. It wasn't really until um, after 1990 that it began uh, uh, adopting a more consistent um, strategy. But it's hard to argue that the creation of CELTIC um, seriously damaged the industry, to put, it at, to put it at that level. And the point I just wanted to make is, is that it was a rare example, a rare example under the conservative governments which held office between 1979 and 1997, a rare example of selective intervention in, in a particular industry. Now, um, because throughout that period, the government's policy was predominantly horizontal, that's to say, not selective, not vertical. And Mrs. Thatcher was um, uh, preoccupied with promoting innovation, entrepreneurship throughout the economy, making the UK more like the US in that respect, uh, and, and, and generally eschewing uh, national champions and so on that had been um, created under the, the um, previous Labour governments. So the main strands in policy during that period that affected biotech were consistent support for the science base, encouraging universities to, or giving universities the freedom to exploit their own intellectual property and, and license uh, technology to, to spin-off firms or to, or to other firms, and using the tax system to encourage venture capital and to encourage investors, private investors, to put money into early stage uh, firms, not just in biotech, but in, in firms of all, of all industries. Important step was the, what became the Enterprise Investment Scheme, which was designed to encourage business angels to, um, to, to do that. So there wasn't very much focus on biotech-specific policies. There were, there were changes in the organization of the research councils, which, which gave biotechnology a, a higher profile. And there was a recognition in government that uh, Startups and early stage biotech firms did face problems in accessing finance and there was one or two small scale schemes run out of the Department of Trade and Industry to try and um, solve those problems. Now, so it was overall, it, as I say, it was overall, it was a non-discriminatory, non-selective um, uh, non policy trying to encourage all science-based industries. Did it work? Well, I think, one could say, perhaps this is a slight exaggeration, but that in this case, Thatcherism worked. Now, this might come as a bit of a shock to people in this university for whom, as you may recall, Thatcher was a bit of a hate figure uh, during her time in, in, in office. But I, I think a reasonable case could be made that in the mid-90s, shortly before the 1997 election, the 
biotech sector had got off to a reasonable start. Lots of new firms had been started, backed by a growing venture capital industry. Many of, several of them had got listed on the stock market, either on the main market or, or, or a name. And uh, the universities were beginning to get more active in spin-offs and, and commercialization. So you were beginning to get a, an environment which was obviously not hardly comparable to the US, but was moving in that direction. So I think it's hard to say that in this first 15, 20 year period of, um, of, uh, of the industry's existence, that the growth of biotech was seriously damaged by errors on the part of government or, or, or lack of support from gov government. Okay, so now we're in the late 90s, Labour government in power, and now we have the famous uh, well-known, too well-known setbacks among, uh, among um, British biotech firms that had previously been regarded as very promising, well-known case of, uh, of British biotech. I must say I was thinking when it was mentioned earlier that wouldn't it be nice if one could go to a biotech conference in which the collapse of, bio, of British biotech was not mentioned. <laughs> I think then we'd be moving forward to, to, uh, to a, new, um, a, new, um, a new era. But anyway, what is clear, whether it was entirely um, British biotech's fault, well clearly it's more wider than that, but the early 2000s saw a much more difficult financing environment for biotechs. Uh, venture capitalists, many of them, switched to um, management buyouts and so on. Um, uh, hard to, hard to um, uh, launch IPOs in London, few on aim, but hardly any on the, on the main market. A very, very difficult period. And this was a matter of great concern to the Labour government that was then in power, which took a particular interest in in um, science-based, knowledge-based industries, biotech, pharma as, as, as one of them. Now, in many ways, the Labour government c continued what Thatcher had done, it, perhaps with a greater emphasis on science and technology, putting more money into the research councils, introducing R&D tax credits to promote um, uh, business-financed research, looking for ways of um, getting the universities more active in, in, um, in, in spin-off. The, there was a partnership with, between MIT and, um, and Cambridge, which Lita was very much involved in, and, and new incentives were introduced to promote that uh, university activity. And I think as, as the 2000s wore on, and particularly after the financial crisis of 2008-9, the thrust of policy shifted more towards uh, more towards what I described as vertical or selective policies. A recognition that globalization, uh, in an era of globalization, we had to concentrate on industries that were likely to um, be able to compete against uh, low-wage countries. And, of course, a very important consideration was the need to um, rebalance the economy away from what was thought to be um, over-reliance on financial services and move them more into manufacturing, manufacturing or services of a, of a science-based or knowledge-based category. So towards the end of that period, towards the end of the Labour government, Peter Mandelson very much in the driving seat on this particular front, new initiatives were set up in order to assist the pharma biotech sector, not, not just biotech, new Office of Life Sciences formed under Lord Drayson, who had been a successful biotech entrepreneur. Lots of effort to make the NHS more innovation friendly, more receptive to, to, novel, um, uh, to novel drugs. Uh, the patent box designed to uh, help the pharmaceutical companies and so on. So you, you had a kind of more active industrial policy aimed at, um, uh, aimed at a number of industries of which pharma biotech w was one. Industrial policy was back in fashion and the new coalition government which took office in, um, in, in 2010 continued that line. Vince Cable as the um, business secretary and David Willits, the 
Minister for Universities and Science, were of the view that government should do more than support basic science, that it should become more involved in helping firms um, in the product development stage through the famous valley of death and so on. So in industrial policy towards pharma biotech was, um, as it were, intensified under that government. And one important element in that was the, was the um, creation of the biomedical catalyst, which has been dis discussed in, in several sessions b before. George Freeman, whom you heard earlier, was appointed uh, Minister for the Life Sciences, reflecting the high priority which, which uh, the government um, uh, attached to the sector. And I'm not sure, but I, I think uh, Sir John may, may talk about this in a minute. I, I think that his policy has been broadly continued um, under the Conservative government, although one reads that the business secretary is not so fond of the idea of the concept of um, industrial strategy. Uh, he's perhaps more of a Thatcherite than, than some of his predecessors. But just to, uh, not to take more than a few minutes of your time, so if you look at the whole period from 1980 to now, to 2016, there has been a bit of a shift from largely non-selective um, uh, horizontal policies towards a more interventionist approach. And I suppose the questions that one is left with is what difference did it all make? What difference did government policy make for good or ill as, as far as the health of the, of the industry is concerned? And are there any lessons that can be learnt from the past to guide government policy in the future? Well, I've mentioned the first 20 years, uh, you know, uh, 1980 to end 90s, um, where I think, maybe it was exaggerated, but I think the biotech sector got off to a reasonably promising start, or seemed to, be, seemed to have got off to a reasonably promising start. It, it's the period after 2000 and into the 2000s where the, which poses much more difficult questions. Would we have done better over the last decade or so, if government policy had been different. Has the shift to intervention, somewhat greater intervention, been helpful? Well, I think the problem with answering those sorts of questions is that policy changes in this kind of area take a very long time to play out. And it's hard to assess the impact that biomedical catalyst is generally welcomed by the industry, as several people have mentioned um, uh, uh, earlier today. But I think it would be hard to argue that the improvement in the fortunes of the UK biosector, which was apparent in 2014 and 2015, I'm thinking of more IPOs, more uh, funding for unquoted firms and so on, hard to link that improvement directly to government policy. Probably more to do with the US investor, uh, revival of US investor interest, putting to the the UK, it wasn't just the UK that improved, it was other European countries as well. Now, I've spent quite a lot of time in the last couple of years interviewing people in the industry, asking what do they want from government. And I think two key themes have been, one, consistent support for the science base, and two, a stable, predictable business environment not too many lurches of policy one more direction than the other. And I think some of them point to the Enterprise Investment Scheme, the EIS, as an example of consistency or, or stability. Created in its present form in 1993, it has pretty much been modified here and there, but, um, uh, but uh, basically the, the, the same structure has, has, um, has been maintained. So science base, stability, and then there is the issue of the NHS and as, a, as, a, as a market uh, and, and uh, the need to make the, the, um, uh, uh, the NHS more receptive to innovative medicines. And I know that's been a big preoccupation for, for George um, Freeman and his, and his advisors on that front. And that obviously is a very important issue. But I think it's, it is worth remembering how small the UK is 
as a percentage of the world pharmaceutical market or the world biologics market, however you, um, however you uh, define it. And the government has, if, if, if um, drug discovery firms want to be world players, they have to focus on the international market and on the US in particular because of the domination of the US in this, in this sector. And the government has no magic wand in which to, to create uh, world-leading companies. It can improve the environment, which it is doing so. So I think the, the lesson, if there is one, is, is, is the need for consistency, patience, stability, creating a stable framework, no quick fixes. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was terrific. Uh, we have speaker, we're just about done, and our best for last we have saved. Uh, but to introduce him is Mina Beekheath. Mina is a DPhil candidate on a Leaders Fellowship at the Oncology Department, University of Oxford. He holds an MSc in drug discovery from UCL and a pharmacy degree. Um, he is the president and founder of OB, and this could not have happened without his help. Uh, he has been really a stalwart. Um, he, he wants me to tell you all that what he strives to do is develop new startups and substantial networking with academic and industrial professionals to pursue translating innovative science into disruptive business. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce the gentleman who said, the only thing I want to do here is introduce our final speaker. And I said, if that's all you want to do, that's an easy one. Mina B. Keith. So I, I have to make this really, really quick. And thank you so much, Mallory. Uh, Mallory has always got something to say. But first things first, I want to thank the kind of a, the team behind this. And um, uh, I think that we owe a, a big thank you to Jean Dries. Uh, John has been a true, uh, 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 an extremely integral part of the, uh, uh, the team that has been putting this together and that it would have not been possible if it wasn't for his support. Uh, most importantly, I also want to uh, thank my team, uh, in particular those that have been putting the pass uh, together uh, with myself, John and Mallory, now will include uh, Ellie Price um, and uh, Mariam Raslan and uh, Naomi and Hannah as well in the back. So thank you so much guys for bringing this together. Um, I just want to say that a big thank you to all of those who have managed to make it today, in particular thanks to the speakers who uh, have travelled from all around the world. I think the, uh, it was a thriving conversation and uh, I'm not going through into any details because I've probably heard so much about the check transfer, but there's anything that we have probably sort of realised is that it's not a black or white sort of an area. We can all agree or disagree with regards to the tactics, strategies and the performances of the uh, technology transfer. Um, uh, sort of infrastructure in Europe. But two things we must be really, really careful about. A, it is changing. Is it changing positively? Is it changing rapidly? And it's changing proactively. I think OB is, is a perfect example of that. Um, we'd like to call OB in turn panacea, and I think panacea has been support, wouldn't have been able to achieve so far if it wasn't for the support from the university and the relevant tech transfer offices. Um, Beyond that sort of a point of the technology transfer, I think we we'll also need to put things into the right context. Putting things into the right context means that the technology transfer is a pretty much complicated process. And in order to be able to have such a, a good conversation, we need to take so, all sort of a different factors into account. Of course, we want to have um, an IP strategy that will accelerate rather than hinder the innovation process. But I don't think that it should be the case that we're blaming it all on the technology transfer offices. Um, You've heard enough so far about the technology transfer, but from our perspective as um, uh, young entrepreneurs, as well as even internally within OB, two things that we are really concerned about is A, acceleration, and B, generation. By acceleration, I mean the acceleration of technology um, uh, generation and the commercialization. I'm not talking about tech transfer in particular, rather than uh, within the grand scheme things. I think we all need to work together to make sure that we lower uh, the barriers, whether these are software barriers, academic cliches, environmental conservativeness, or even some uh, the lack of entrepreneurial talent, or, or hardcore barriers such as the lack of capital, or sometimes even the concrete infrastructure. 
and the second point, which is degeneration. I'll quote very quickly Peter Thiel saying uh, what, uh, uh, what happened to the future in the Funds Fund uh, Manifesto. And I think that is exactly what we need to be addressing. We're quite lucky to be representing a lot of uh, the most, uh, some of the most influential, um, globally influential organizations, uh, uh, universities, and companies around the world today. But what we really need to do is that we do understand the need to have a framework for universities to protect or preserve the IP at some points, yet that's not enough. We need to dig deeper, much deeper, to be able to generate de nouveau technologies and novel ventures. Um, I always say that I think we've landed at the right time, the right place, sometimes, but uh, in order to be able to achieve that, we need to believe that this is the generation of innovation. And to be able to achieve that, we need to have your help and your expertise. Talk about help and expertise, I would I'm really privileged to be able to be introduce Professor J Sir John Bell. Uh, professor Sir John Bell is the Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford University, Chairman of the Office for the Strategic Coordination of the Health Research. He served as a President of the Academy of Medical Sciences and he is a Rhodes Scholar. Sir John undertook his medical training in the UK, then went to Stanford, returning to the UK. Uh, the late 80s. Oh, God. Look, that's good. These guys want to go for it. Thank you very much. Terrific. <laughs> right. So, look, I, I, I've got the, the, the final slot here, and this is a difficult task to wrap up at the end of what obviously has been a terrific meeting. I, I, I thought, though, I would try and make one or two relatively straightforward points about what I think the UK can do to performance to improve its performance in the in the biotech sector, and I'll start with a with this sort of headline, which is the bad news, and that is in, depending on where you start, 35 or 40 years of biotechnology in the UK, we have systematically led Europe in terms of the number of companies, the number of products under development, any metric you want to name. And yet, um, over that time period, I think it's fair to say we haven't created a single mid-size biopharmaceutical company. Now, we could argue about cell tech, but the truth is it was bought by UCB before it produced anything. BTG has actually emerged as an interesting player, but taken a very long time. But the truth is it's a, it's a pretty dismal record given the opportunities that we've had. So I think one of the real questions that we have to ask ourselves, what are the really fundamental reasons why that's the case? And we could talk a lot about whether government it, intervention has been good or bad. I think it's been a mix of those things over a long period of time. Some of the things they've done, I think, have helped. Some of them have hindered. But the truth is we know that government intervention doesn't work because the Germans did the experiment. They put, poured a ton of money into their biotech sector and got nowhere. So that, I, that model of, of industrial strategy, I think, has been tested once. And once you've done the experiment once, there's not a lot point of doing it again. So. Uh, is it the universities? Well, I think I'll make an argument that there are features of universities in the UK that are uh, inhibit the development of commercialization. But I think those issues are disappearing, um, uh, increasingly disappearing. And I think having spent seven years at Stanford, I, I think the big universities in the UK are now increasingly looking like the big American universities in terms of the creation of interesting IP and their ability to get them uh, out the door in one form or another. Um, I, I'm going to argue today that, that A, it's better than you think it is, and, and I haven't heard all the talks today, but I hope someone's also said this, and that is the truth is biotechnology and innovation in the UK today is pretty good. And by European standards, it's clearly the best. And by international standards, it's, you can, it's probably number three in the world. But the reason that we haven't really gone to the kind of levels of success of America are, I, in my view, the type of capital that's been available to grow companies over long periods of time. Let me just talk to you about the, the Golden Triangle. You know this is Oxford, Cambridge, and London. It's a spectacular place for medical research. It's got four universities in the top, to top 20 globally, five medical schools in the top 20 globally, including number one and number three, depending on what um, league table you want to use. It's got 
major research institutes, the Sanger, soon to open the Crick, and Harwell, just south of Oxford. And it's got, I think, really unique science infrastructure that you can only do in a system where you've got a single pair of healthcare system and sustained support for biomedical research. UK Biobank is now undoubtedly the best prospective cohort on the planet. It's also the best genetic research source on the planet. Uh, and um, you could only really do that experiment here. The, in America, you've tried to do Biobank about four times in my lifetime, and you haven't succeeded yet. And I doubt that the, um, the new precision medicine plan is going to deliver anything as good as Biobank. Genomics England, 100,000 whole genomes in patients in the NHS, again, miles ahead of the competition. The bioresource, a national biorepository for biological samples, again, you can only do it in a small country with a, a single um, uh, uh, healthcare system. Uh, interestingly, when you count companies, this is hard because if you look on the web, you get very, very different answers. But if you take the whole of the southeast of England, there are several thousand biotech companies and life sciences companies in the southeast. The Cambridge cluster is very powerful. There's a bit of stuff on the M11. There's a lot of stuff in London that nobody's really counted up yet. And then the Thames Valley has got about 800 life sciences companies. So, in fact, in numerically, it's pretty good. But it's not a cluster. Everybody fights with each other. They don't talk to each other. It's completely sociologically incoherent. Um, the transport infrastructure doesn't work. No places for anybody to live. It is definitely not a cluster. But it is big. We've got a, also a global financial center in London that's just beginning to get it. Uh, and it's a pretty diversified cluster. So I've, I'm a real believer that the really successful clusters, and I think Silicon Valley and Boston are good examples of this, the really good clusters are not pure biotech plays. Because many of the most exciting things come out of non-biotech stuff. And again, the southeast of England plays in that domain pretty well. So it, it's pretty good. And, and when you line up the big clusters around the world, there's no question that the southeast, the Golden Triangle cluster fits in that space. Uh, it's big. There are 40 higher education institutions. We get 1.8 billion pounds of research funding. 40% of the whole UK research funding goes into the southeast. 110,000 postgraduate students, 320,000 undergraduates. There's the stuff. Uh, there's no question that the Golden Triangle plays at a pretty impressive level on a metric basis, but not on a cultural basis. And again, another slide, you don't really need to look at this except to say the obvious winners here are San Francisco and the Bay Area and Boston, but Cambridge, Oxford, and London are pretty close and certainly dominant in European terms. Now, our, our little space in Oxfordshire and the Thames Valley is interesting. This is a, a map of the companies that are present in Oxfordshire. There's a, a lot of them across many different domains. Like a lot of clusters, they sit within a relatively tight area, although I have to say it's more distributed than the Cambridge cluster, which is an extremely tightly organized cluster. Uh, and it's a wide diversity of different high-tech businesses. But I think this is the interesting map. So this is a map, and you can see that Oxford's out to the left, London down here, and Cambridge up there. The, 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 this is a dinky little country. And in fact, you can see if you take Greater Boston and you plonk it on top, starting with Oxford on the left-hand side, you pretty much get to the outskirts of London. And if you take Silicon Valley and you go north-south, you pretty much get. So it's a bit like the two clusters sitting side by side. It is, re I know if you came up here by car, you'll think it's a long way from London to Oxford, but the truth is it isn't. And if you travel very late at night, as I often do, it takes me 35 to 40 minutes to get from London to my home. A and of course, it's well served by railways. The biggest single problem that we've got, of course, is the getting from Oxford to Cambridge. And those of you, the academics in the audience who've tried to get from Oxford to Cambridge will know, it takes sort of three to three and a half hours and uh, that's on a good day. So one of the plans that the government currently has in play is to open a new railway line, which will go from Oxford to Cambridge, It'll take about an hour. It's called, George Freeman calls it the innovation line, but that's definitely on the track, and that'll actually create the triangle, 
which basically means you can get to any two points in the triangle as quickly as you can from the top of Silicon Valley to the bottom of Silicon Valley. And to be clear, anybody who thinks the traffic in Silicon Valley is light hasn't been to Silicon Valley recently. So, you know, you can sit on 101 for a very long period of time. So, you know, we all have the same sort of issues. And we all have issues with housing prices and all that kind of stuff. So, and also the academic institutions also fight with each other like crazy. So there's no love lost between UCSF and Stanford, for example. So, so you know, we all have, I think, similar features. What I'd like to talk about is this, because this is what we haven't achieved in the UK, and that's the creation of these types of companies. And actually, we could talk about how great it is to have big pharma companies. The truth is, there are issues in big pharma, but there are not issues in mid-sized companies, and they have certain characteristics. They tend on the whole to be focused on single therapeutic areas. They tend to be co-located on single sites so they can talk to each other rather than flying around the world. And that on the whole, they have great pipelines of highly innovative medicines. And th I think this is what we should be aspiring to because I think that's what really has created an awful lot of the innovation in this sector over the past 20 years. And the, all four of these companies are terrific in their own domains, Genentech in the cancer space, Novo in the metabolic space, Celgene in cancer and inflammation, and of course Gilead in the viral space. These are really good examples. Now if we had one of those, we should be really, really happy, and I think that should be an aspiration. But it's also worth remembering how long it takes to build a mid-sized company, and I've put in sort of rough terms the timelines. Cell gene is almost as old as I am, for God's sake. It's been around for years. Those of you who follow it, you know. And it, let me tell you, it was not terrific for a very, very, very long time. But it's a pretty interesting company now. Novo Nordisk, again, been around a long time, but particularly steady and impressive growth over the past decade. Gilead's been around for yonks. And of course, Genentech, Genentech had started up shortly before I arrived at Stanford and really, really hit the highlights with Recept in 1998. And, uh, uh, so, you know, these are, these are pretty interesting companies, but they are interesting companies that have taken a long time to grow. So if, we're, um, if we have ambitions to create mid-sized companies, we've got uh, we've to take time. And uh, these are a few of the local companies that have reached the, cl something close to the billion dollar mark. That's a sort of a metric that people use to compare them. We, we've got a few, but the truth is we haven't really created any companies that sell things and, and make products. and that's ultimately the definitive step. So this is the ecosystem that works. You've got universities, they research and collaborate with pharma, venture capital spins out SMEs, you exit, you do IPOs, you make, and then you end up with mid-sized biotechs. So that's the kind of thing that you would kind of like to have. The trouble is that the red, the red features are the bits that don't work. The universities don't work very well. Venture capital is very short term and lousy. Research collaborations with industry doesn't work on the whole. Pharma is falling over and we don't have any mid-sized biotechs and you can't do IPOs. So as a starting place, it, it ain't so terrific. Um, and one of, of course, big reasons that this has been this long period of time, and this is a key point, and that is the misalignment of capital sources with the length of time it takes to build real companies means that you can't do it unless you have long-term capital. And, you know, lots of my friends are venture capitalists. I'm sure there's a ton of you out in the audience. But the truth is, seven-year funds don't play because this is a 15-year project. So if you really want to do this, you've got to find sources of capital that will take you through a 15-year time frame. And that's one of the big problems. In North America, venture capitalists have deep enough pockets that they can run over that period of time. And I can show you some good examples of that. But in Europe, they don't. And that's, I think, probably, if I had to say anything, the single biggest problem. Let me tell you some personal stories, which actually I think highlight that point. The guy on this side of the slide is one of the most talented graduate students we've had here. He's a New Zealander. His name's uh, Garth Cooper. When I got back from Stanford in 1988, he came to me and he said, I've sequenced the peptide that creates the amyloid in beta cells in the pancreas that all type 2 diabetic patients have in the, in the pancreas when they develop the disease. There's a very important message for those of you chasing amyloid in the brains of um, Alzheimer's patients because the observation that there's amyloid there does not mean 
that it has anything to do with the causation of the disease. And this was a very good example of that. However, when he walked in my office, we didn't know that. And he said, I'm not going to get a grant. What am I going to do? I said, set up a company. He said, I don't have any idea to do that. I called this guy on the left, who many of you American guys will know, Ted. And he was a friend from Stanford. He's based in San Diego. I said, Ted, are you interested in this? And he said, what's this guy Cooper doing tomorrow? I said, I don't know. And he said, put him on a plane send them to San Diego. So that's where this company Amelin was created. That's the, it's very simply the story. It's a great story because it went on to be a company that was ultimately sold to BMS for two and a half or three billion dollars. And they created all kinds of value over a long period of time. That's not really the point. And it was not, and they didn't create it in the UK. And the reason was they tried to and they couldn't because they couldn't find the sources of capital. They couldn't even find a place to put it in 1988. Uh, but this is the story, and I think it's, it's a perfect story because it's a 20-year journey from 1987 to 2007. It takes 20 years, and in this case, it was funded by Ted and his mates, all venture capitalists, for 20 years. It got delisted from NASDAQ. It crashed so badly at one point, and they refinanced the whole darn thing from scratch. So unless you've got those long-term sources of capital, it's going to be really hard to make mid-sized companies. And you know that's the you know that's basically it's a 20-year journey, and unless you've got alignments uh, of capital, it'll, it doesn't work. Now this is another story, which is a local story and it's a current story, but I think it tells the same story. And the guy on the left is Ben Jacobson. He was a postdoc in my lab, one of the best postdocs I'd ever had, uh, working on recombinant expression of T cell receptors. The guy on the right-hand side, your left, oh, sorry, on your right is is. Um, James Noble, who was a local entrepreneur who came out, incidentally, sort of say this again, British biotech. Well, one thing that British biotech did, it trained some people about how not to do biotech. And he was one of them, and he's a terrific guy. And together, they've had a 15-year journey of creating really substantial value. And they did it by using recombinant T-cell receptors that see peptides in the context of MHC on the surface of a whole variety of cells, including cancer cells. And um, the, the story began with the usual university spin-out, hard time raising money, money from venture capitalists, venture capitalists in, as soon as they get in the door, they start looking at how they're going to get out. So they sold the company five years in, so the company died. And um, these guys, with some angel investors, bought the company back out from where it had been sold some two or three years later. It was a German biotech company who didn't know what to do with the technology, and they bought it back out. And they've successfully created, I think, a terrific platform of immuno-oncology. So this is in the immuno-oncology space. It's also got a play in, um, it's also got a really interesting play uh, in inflammatory and infectious diseases. But the exciting thing about this is that it doesn't rely on mutated peptides or checkpoint control, but in fact, it sees tumor-specific antigens on the cell surface. Everybody's got one of these slides, but this is a, an adaptamine slide before and after. Um, uh, this therapy really works, and it works on solid tumors. For those of you who invested in CAR T cells, this works on solid tumors, and it sees all kinds of different pept all kinds of different peptides, not just two. So. So it's a really terrific technology. That took, that started 2001. It's taken up to now to do it. It's required many, many rounds of support, largely from a group of angel investors who have put a very large amount of money. Both companies are valued at more than a billion dollars. And Immunicor will get a product, we hope, on the market in 2017, 18, uh, all going well. So. That's a, that maybe they make, might make it. Immunicore is still a private company, so I'm quite optimistic that it will get over the finish line. Um, so what, what, what's really needed? Well, I, we need long-term risk capital. It's a really important thing. You know, the Americans have got it because they've got these fantastic venture capital firms that have deep, deep, deep pockets, and they just don't exist yet, as such in Europe. We've now got some. Uh, Oxford Science Innovation, you heard Alex Snow earlier today, terrific plan, I think a really powerful long-term investment strategy. Neil Woodford's fund, which is also based in Oxford, his patient capital fund, which is 890 million pounds, is a real source of money. And other companies like Mallon, which again, have got a very long-term strategy to their investment. The continental Europeans do this with family and foundation ownership. 
Now, we're a bit snooty about that, because we say, well, families don't know how to run companies, so we don't encourage it. But the truth is, if you look at all the great successes, or many of the great successes in European biotechnology, they've had family or foundation support. Novo Foundation, it's only there because they have a foundation. Lundbeck, Altana, Janssen, UCB, Roche, that's the story. So there's an interesting question about whether we need to be a bit less snooty about this and provide the necessary incentives. We, do, we need more early phase investment, and, and we've had some significant progress here in that space as well. It's very early stage stuff. It, it, there's not much of it around, and we need more of it. I'm a real believer in adjacent innovation, placing this close to um, our major academic centers. We need better commercial science infrastructure. We're always short of a science park space all the way through the southeast, and we need a much better business network. So, so I think the case I'd like to make is that we're now starting to see sources of long-term capital, and I think that's going to make a huge difference. Is there anything that universities themselves can do, given the fact that the capital is going on outside those universities? And I've listed five things here that I think universities can help to do. One is there's a real role in universities for open innovation, because that's where a lot of stuff comes in. This has got to do with not being greedy and trying to make money. You're trying to have impact, not actually generate a lot of income for the university. And I think we've got some great examples of that. We've got to increase and expand our translational capabilities in the NHS and in universities because it's a terrific mechanism to get companies to get in demand quickly and show that they've got effective, um, uh, effective molecules. We can do better on tech transfer. That's been discussed a lot today. I think there's no ambiguity about that. We can do better on tech transfer. We need to shorten the gestation of period of, 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 of companies, and there's a lot going on to do that. And we need to reduce the, reduce the burn rate. So, you know, single molecule companies that have a chief executive officer, a chief financial officer, a head of development, a head of business development, and God knows how the hangers on, and burn about 600,000 pounds a year before they've made a cup of tea. That is not an efficient way to run a company, and that is the standard pattern uh, in this com country. I'm not going to spend much time on these. They're just, those are the points I think are important, except to point out that I think we have got the best open innovation platform in Europe and probably in the world, in the SGC, um, which is a terrific open innovation platform. We've started to develop much better translational capac capacities. The NHS has got a billion pounds it puts into this every year and that's starting to happen. The tech, the tech transfer issues you've talked about today, but with the model is, is, I think, changing. And there has to be this focus, the point's been made, on our impact rather than our income, because ultimately we'll be judged on impact. I think we can shorten gestation periods, biomedical catalyst you talked about, but there are other ways of doing that, including doing more stuff in universities before you spin out companies. You've got to reduce their burn rates and share both management and facilities. Uh, and this is our local solution to that, which is the local bio escalator. So um, I'm going to stop there because I think you guys have all had enough, and so have I. Um, so, um, but I just, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that, that we're not in a bad place. We're in a pretty good place. We've got a whole load of stuff. The academic platform's great. The support for science is terrific. But there are a few things we need to do to try and get this right. And I think one is to stop thinking about these companies as being a three to five year play. They are 15 to 20 year plays. And if we think about it in those terms, we back our management and we get long term capital, we will create mid sized companies because the platform is so terrific here. And they'll go on to be great generators of of economic growth for the UK. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Is that okay? Really.